day of the uh, Global Tax Symposium, I, um, we, today we have a very interesting program. Yesterday we started what we were saying, how interesting it is that the first presentation was from New Zealand and then after we moved to South Africa and then we went all the way to India and then to, uh, to the UK. So that was a really nice trip through all around the world and today we will do exactly the same. <coughs> Uh, unfortunately, people from New Zealand and Australia, it's almost the middle of the night, so we may forgive them this time <laughs> because it's a little too much. I don't know if, if anyone will join a break, anyone, but anyway, so thank you so much for being here. Today we have our second day and we will give, uh, we have two papers to discuss, one from uh, Daniel Artana and Alejandro Rastelesi and from Argentina, and then after we have Vincent Aral Bender. All, uh, from Canada, and I will just give the word to Suranjali, who will be uh, uh, the chair, but perhaps I give just one minute to Eduardo. Eduardo Bajstroki, would you like to say something? Yes, a very warm, warm welcome to day two. <laughs> <laughs> Only that? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, we have here also Eduardo Traversa, who is also together with Miranda Stewart, one of the co-organizers. And as I mentioned, Miranda cannot be at this moment because of the time difference. But uh, we, I will give the word to Suranjali. Suranjali, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Irma. And I think the way the discussion started, I think we all miss meeting in person and chatting about the weather. So uh, welcome back. Um, you know, I think today we're going to cross over to LATAM and talk about the LATAM tax system. We have Daniel Artano with us. Thank you so much for joining us. I think it's a very interesting paper. Uh, he's a professor at UTDD Argentina. And we have two very interesting discussants. One is uh, Professor McKean and um, Professor Alison Christians, both uh, are leading voices in international tax. So I look forward to the discussion and Daniel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure for me to be here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is a, a joint paper that we wrote with my colleagues in the fiscal division of the Inter-American Development Bank. Carol, Emilio, and Alejandro. I will do the presentation and then later we can, Alejandro and us will, will try to uh, respond to the comments by Michael Allison and, and, and the other participants. Uh, well, let me tell you uh, first, uh, just to uh, remind everybody, uh, this is the measure of the tax burden of several Latin American countries. And then you have in black, the OECD, simple average and weighted average. Uh, you see that uh, there is no size that fits all. You see countries that have very low tax burdens, like Guatemala, Paraguay, and others that have tax burdens similar to the uh, more developed nations. When you look at the composition of tax revenues, uh, you see that the countries that are uh, have the highest tax burdens in the region, most of them uh, have those red uh, rectangles relatively high. Those red rectangles are the uh, collections obtained from cascade, uh, financial transaction taxes, and other taxes that are more inefficient than the average. Uh, and uh, that's something that uh, you have to take into consideration. Those countries have relatively high tax burdens, explain part of the difference uh, with the other countries in the region because they overuse uh, this kind of uh, distortive taxes that uh, are uh, a source of, in, uh, that collect a lot of money. Their green bars are uh, bad collections. They are relatively similar to OECD. And obviously you know that the main difference between uh, LATAM countries and OECD countries in terms of revenues have to do with taxes on income, including social security contributions as a tax on labor income. Uh, on average, Latin American countries collect about 50% of what uh, what's collected in more developed nations, uh, with the exception of Uruguay, that collects, that obtains a lot of revenues from social security uh, contribution. With that, let me go on uh, to discuss some of the main taxes. Uh, in the VAT, uh, what we think is the most important problem in the region is the proliferation of reduced rates and exemptions for sales to the domestic market. We uh, did uh, several studies, and one of these uh, includes a sample analysis of a sample of 10 Latin American countries. And uh, uh, the average fiscal loss because of tax expenditure in the VAT for those countries was, uh, was uh, 
about 2.4% of GDP, which is about 35% of VAT collections. But uh, obviously, in some countries, it's even more, uh, more severe. In countries like Colombia, uh, uh, fiscal loss because of tax expenditures is similar to the collection of the VAT that uh, Colombia is uh, obtaining. Question is, uh, most of these tax expenditures are justified uh, because they are trying to improve the redistribution of income. Uh, in most countries, you have exemptions in, or, or reduced rates in, in, in foods and other, uh, and other products that are uh, deemed to be important for the, for the, for the consumption of, of the poorest families. And so the question is if these tax expenditures are progressive. Well, we uh, did uh, an, an analysis of that using uh, income service and expenditure surveys, and uh, we found that they are progressive. Uh, in this, uh, we are ordering individuals here according to their per capita income. And you know that when you order people according to their per capita income, usually the VAT is regressive. And that's what we found in the eight countries. But when we put the focus on the tax expenditures, you see that they are progressive, but uh, they are pro-rich. Meaning by that, that uh, as you see in the graph, about 40% of the tax loss because of the uh, tax expenditures in the VAT is enjoyed by people in the highest, uh, uh, of the top 25, 20% uh, of the income distribution. And if you add uh, the fourth quintile, uh, meaning that uh, you are about 60 to 70% in some countries. So obviously that means that a big part of the fiscal loss is enjoyed by the relatively the high medium class and the rich in our region. Another thing that we explore is, uh, as you know, in, uh, there is a lot of informality in Latin America and what happens when there is informality, uh, probably you are familiar with the paper done by Pierre Vachas and his colleagues at the World Bank. Uh, that he explores uh, the fact that uh, the poor make uh, a large fraction of their purchases in informal shops. And you can identify an expenditure surveys in informal shops. And uh, if you assume as they do that informal shops transfer tax savings to the consumer, then uh, the VAT may be even progressive. Remember that in uh, the Bashas paper, they order the individuals according to their per capita consumption. When you do that, usually the VAT is proportional, not progressive. But in any case, what you found is, what they found is that uh, the VAT may even be uh, progressive. And so tax expenditures to have that are included or are uh, included in legislation to improve income distribution have uh, no rationale. But what we try to explore here is uh, what happens if the informal shops do not transfer the full amount of the tax saving to the consumer because they have to keep part of the, the, the tax that they evade to finance, so to speak, their lower productivity. There is, a, we, quote, we, uh, we quote in the paper several studies where uh, uh, the, there is some uh, evidence that uh, the uh, more informal shops are less productive than the formal ones. So what we uh, did with this is you have three bars here. The blue bar is uh, the, uh, no, the light blue bar is uh, the uh, standard VAT with no, with no correction either by Bashas or Baras. Usually you find that the ratio of the, this is the ratio of the, the tax burden of the highest decile to the uh, burden of the lowest decile. So when you have, a number of one, in, it suggests that the VAT is proportional. As you see, the light blue bars are uh, close to one in most countries uh, uh, that we have, of the eight countries that we could do the analysis. The blue bars show the Bashas estimates for these countries with the Bashas methodology. And you see that, uh, as we, I mentioned before, the tax becomes progressive uh, because the ratio is much higher than one in most countries. But when we uh, uh, assume that about 50%, 50-50 rule, that 50% of the tax savings passed to the consumer and then 50% is kept by the shop to finance its uh, lower productivity, you see that uh, the Bashas result is uh, reduced, though it's not eliminated. You might still maintain that and that these assumptions, the VAT is progressive, but much less than when you ignore the fact that informal shops may keep part of the tax savings to finance their lower productivity. 
So we explored then some uh, reform options uh, similar to this uh, reform options we have discussed in the past by other IDB, uh, uh, other IDB guys. Uh, assume that uh, you try to compensate the poor for, uh, in the case that countries decide to generalize the VAT. And we run exercise where you compensate the additional VAT that they have to pay when the VAT is generalized, or uh, you compensate the full VAT. And you basically find that uh, in the first case, when you compensate the additional VAT for the, uh, after the generalization of the VAT, what you uh, find is that uh, the VAT, the revenues of the VAT increase in all the seven countries that we do the exercise, okay? And income distribution, this is important, would be the same done without this generalization, generalization with compensation. The other exercise is obviously more pro poor because you compensate the poor for the full VAT that they pay. And then in this case, income distribution improves in the seven countries, but tax collections decline in three of them. There is a paper by uh, Michael Keane where he discusses uh, the possibility of doing this. Uh, and obviously this is, if you have uh, schemes of compensation to the poor that are relatively effective, you can think of doing things like this. And in these countries in the region, they had most of them uh, schemes that, uh, comp that transfer money uh, to the poor that uh, are working relatively efficiently. So the question is, why countries are not doing this? Why they prefer to maintain this exemption of reduced rates in the VAT? And basically we conclude that it is it's either because the non-poor have an influence on policy design, meaning by the middle class or, or the rich, or because the society does not trust that the government will uh, distribute this additional compensation efficiently. But what is basically something that has been discussed in the, in the, in the, in the region before, there is no much rational for having these exemptions. You can compensate the poor and get some more money from the government or, in, or uh, improve income distribution. Let's move now to the income tax. As I mentioned before, the collection here is much lower in developed nations. Why? Well, there are some obvious explanation. Informality is much higher in the region than in the developed nations. The minimum exempt levels in the income tax are relatively higher in the region than in OECD countries. That helps to explain why only at most 15% of the population in the region pays income tax, well, while in the OECD is more than 40% of the population. Then you have uh, in most uh, economies, the marginal rate for the personal income tax are lower than in OECD countries. And as I will show you in a minute, tax expenditures are relatively high. Also in the income tax, that is the more progressive tax uh, in, in, in the region. Well, uh, when we, uh, in any case, we have to take into consideration that in the region, uh, tax, uh, the taxation of labor income is, uh, uh, is, uh, is basically done through social security, social security contribution. So I will show you a, a graph where we add them all as the OECD does. But first, uh, before uh, showing you that, uh, tax expenditures in the income tax, here in this table, you have the personal income tax and the and the company income tax, when you add them, uh, basically that explains from a low of 3% of the income tax revenues in countries like Bolivia, in, in Bolivia to 26% of income tax revenues. So uh, the tax expenditures in the income tax are relatively important in the region. And as I mentioned before, they are basically very regressive because the tax itself is very progressive. Well, when you uh, calculate as the OECD does uh, the tax wage uh, on salaried worker earning the average wage, uh, you, as we, they do in the OECD, uh, you we included here the employer contribution in blue, the employee contribution to the social security system in gray, and the income tax in red. You see that the income tax for people making the average wage is important in the OECD. In the countries that we analyze in, uh, in these uh, studies, uh, only in Mexico, the income tax has some re relevance. Uh, in the other countries, what explains the taxation of labor income is social security contributions uh, that are relatively high in some countries of the region. Uh, one thing that we note in the paper is that uh, 
workers in Latin America are uh, on average less productive than workers in developed nations. So probably a better comparison would be with people uh, making in the OECD less than the average wage. And the taxation there is lower. So probably in the region, uh, taxation on labor income, uh, at least is not low. And you have to take into consideration that informality in the labor market in the region is high. So when you make recommendations to change the tax policy design in these countries, you have to take in the back of your mind that informality is much higher in the region than it is in Europe or in the US or, or in Japan. Well, uh, we did some simulations, reducing uh, the minimum exempt level in the income tax, uh, in this case, by 20% uh, in all the countries. And you see there that uh, revenues increased that are the black dots measured on the right axis, in some cases by a substantial amount. And the reform, the tax, it's still very progressive. What you have in the, right, in the bars measured in the right axis is the quasi-genie. It's much higher than the uh, Gini for the distribution of income, which is 50 or below 50 in most of the countries in the region. You see that the uh, uh, personal income tax became a little bit, a little bit less progressive when you reduce the minimum exempt level, but it's still very progressive. So reducing the minimum exempt level has some, it's maybe an efficient instrument to improve revenues and improve income distribution. Obviously, it's a costly from a political point of view. Let me move uh, briefly on some exercises. We discuss others in the paper, but I don't have time them, uh, to discuss them here. Taxes on fuels are uh, lower in the region compared to Europe, as you see there, uh, and also explain a lower share of, of tax revenues. But uh, many countries in the region in, have at the same time taxes on fuels and subsidies on fuels. And so when you net uh, the subsidies on fuels, uh, the tax collection net of tax of subsidies on fuels is not 1% of GDP as is shown there, but it's much lower, 0.4%, and then it's only one third of what is collected uh, in, in Europe when you net out the subsidies. And uh, other problems and some conclusions that we include in this paper, as I mentioned at the beginning, has high cascade in efficient taxes are very important in countries like Argentina, Brazil, or, at the, or also in some other countries at the subnational level. Some countries in the region also use taxes on financial transactions that as most of the collection of these taxes is obtained for business is another example of a cascade tax, and as we know, they are highly inefficient. Tax evasion is still high in spite that it has been declining when in the countries that have uh, information for several years. In, uh, especially in income taxes is very high as uh, there are several estimates are done by other people, not by us. That suggests that it's maybe about 70% uh, of tax revenues. Uh, but we conclude that tax systems in the region have many flaws, but that they are not a failure. Uh, and we also mention in the paper that obviously when the pandemic is over, uh, the region, as it happens in other regions in the world, we, there will be a need to reduce fiscal deficits. Uh, and obviously a reduction in inefficiency in public expenditures might provide some uh, money to reduce this deficit, but there might be a need to increase revenues at the same time that we need uh, to foster growth and uh, increase formal employment. And so taking all, all that into consideration, this is a summary of some policy options that we think should be in the list of any government in the region trying to improve the design of their tax system. First of all, uh, improvements in the efficacy of tax administration should be a priority for the reasons I, for the reasons I just mentioned. A reduction in tax expenditures may provide enough resources to address future fiscal challenges, and in some countries may even allow for reduction in tax rates. There is room in some countries to, include, to increase excises on fuel, cigarettes, uh, and alcohol, and that money may be used to reduce excises on goods, because many countries use, introduce a lot of excises that just for revenue reasons. In the personal income tax, there is some, uh, as I showed, I show you before some room to reduce the minimum exempt levels. 
uh, if uh, payroll taxes uh, and income tax do not make uh, the tax uh, very high, is because we have to take into account the fact that informality is very high in the region. I didn't mention in the presentation, but I discussed in the paper, the regimes for small taxpayers are in most countries in the regions have a lot of problems. They create bunching, they have large jumps in, in the increase of the average burden when you move to the formal, to the generalized regime. So they need to be modified to avoid, avoid those problems. Uh, obviously, if uh, there is, it would be uh, better to uh, uh, replace the cascade and efficient taxes by uh, one way to finance that is by reducing exemptions in the VAT or in uh, the personal income tax. But the low visibility of the cascade taxes make a reform like this very challenging from a political uh, economy point of view. And uh, increasing revenues for property taxes is possible, but that requires uh, to continue investment in uh, to keep the cadastres up to date uh, because the valuation of real estate and other assets is a crucial thing to have uh, good property taxes. With that, uh, I finish my 20 minutes uh, and thank you. Uh, and we are ready to listen to, to the comments. Thank you so much, Daniel. You really sort of kept in time. I think uh, finished two minutes prior to your reported time. I'd like to invite Professor Michael King, who was formerly at the IMF and uh, now I think is affiliated with Kyoto College. Uh, Michael, uh, Professor King, please go ahead. <clears throat> well, hi everyone, thanks very much. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to have been asked to, to read this paper. I uh, enjoyed doing so. Um, I should say I'm not a uh, claim to be a great expert on the tax system to Latin America, which was great for me because it meant I learned a lot, but um, uh, you'll probably also find some of my comments may be kind of touched by ignorance and uh, kind of conventional wisdom that may be not correct. But, um, well, first of all, as I say, I enjoyed the paper. Um, I guess a couple of points really coming from the title where we're asked to think, you know, are these systems a success or a failure? The question, of course, comes up, well, success or failure exactly for who? Who are we talking about? Who? Is, who what standards are we using? Of course, the paper takes a basic kind of a technocratic, one would say, view of, uh, of what we're trying to accomplish with tax systems. And fair enough, um, leads to policy conclusions that I think it's hard to argue with. Um, but of course, the question comes up, well, maybe it's successful for some groups and a failure for other groups. And certainly one of the kind of um, views, I guess, I've tended to inherit from somewhere or other about Latin American tax systems is uh, kind of particularly shaped by the influence of, of elite groups, um, shaping both tax and spending uh, to their to their own interests, true everywhere, but I think there's a sort of general view this has been, often for quite deep historical reasons, has been particularly marked in, in Latin America, which prompts, I think, a couple of questions. One is, well, if you take this technocratic view, how might you overcome the kind of resistance that at one point um, uh, Daniel hinted at, the, the kind of potential power of the elites in blocking reforms, but for example, interesting, the paper mentions contrasting experiences in Colombia, where we know there's been difficulties in reform lately, uh, against Costa Rica, which has done a fairly major reform, apparently without too much difficulty. And it would be nice to know, for example, can we say a bit more about why that is? What are the different circumstances? Were there packaging? Are there different power structures in the two countries? Um, so can we, it'd be nice to tease out a little bit more some of the political economy, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, the second question is probably even deeper because we also know, again, taking kind of broad historical sweep, that tax systems that can be dominated by elites, by elites in some sense can run into quite different, quite fundamental stability problems because it may be that um, it's recognized that there's a general benefit from a reform of the tax system, but each elite has kind of blocking power and these things never happen. Of course, we think about the, the French Revolution, but we can think maybe more mundanely of things in Latin America. You know, we have Venezuela, we have, uh, we have Cuba. Uh, there are some countries kind of not in, the, not in the sample in a way, maybe a little bit of a selection bias in some sense. Um, but without going into those kind of deep uh, historical issues, which maybe economists and lawyers aren't best suited to look at, it makes one think, well, maybe we should also be, when we think about success fairly, we should also think about sustainability of the overall fiscal system. So what about deficits? What about debt? So we look at, I think, Ecuador and Chile have more or less the same tax ratios, but have very different debt levels. 
maybe in some sense, these notions of stability should come into our assessments of tax systems. Of course, you might say, well, no, hang on, we're just looking at the tax system. But when we come to looking at the spending side, we're quite comfortable taking in, or the, when we look at distributional issues, we think we should look at the overall tax system and bring in um, the spending side too. Maybe we need to do that a little bit more in the kind of macro sense as well. I know that's not kind of the standard way of doing things, but I think it's something one, one might want to think about. A second point coming from the title, uh, I'll be much briefer because it's kind of a fairly obvious point, is, um, is the rationale for this particular group of countries where we are lumping together quite different countries, it seems to me. We have Barbados, um, Bahamas, uh, Jamaica in there. Um, and I can see some kind of bureaucratic reasons why we treat this, these as a group, but maybe some, some sense of why, why are kind of averages for this group uh, of particular interest or relevance um, are there, leads into the night, which again, the paper begins to do right at the, at the start to say, well, are there kind of clusters of country in here that we can distinguish? Are there types of countries in terms of tax ratios, debt ratios, tax mixes? Can we pick out some, some clusters? And there, I think maybe some little kind of regression analysis but no causality, of course, but might be helpful to pick out some kind of clusters or groups of, of countries. Um, and when you have this group of countries, it might also be interesting to, to, to explore a bit more, which again, the paper does to some extent, whether there are lessons across countries that one might look at. So these can be quite micro things. So I seem to recall that Argentina is using drones to help implement the property tax. Do we think that's a success? Is that generalizable? So maybe once you have tied down the group, some, some more kind of drawing on comparisons and experiences within them would be helpful. Um, finally, just to continue the discussion's traditional theme of asking for more from a paper, uh, there are a number of issues maybe I'd have liked to have heard a little bit more about. So one heading for me is always informality, um, which is a bit of a kind of, I admit, I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet, a bit of an obsession about the term informality. So I just don't think it's often very useful when we come to think about uh, tax issues. Seems to me the real issue is always for us when we think about uh, in, uh, tech systems, it's compliance. Informality, I don't know what it means, it has different meanings in different contexts. Um, so I, I get a bit passionate about this, I apologize. But for example, we, we're told in the paper that you know, informality is a big problem uh, in these countries, but then we're also told you know, the tax threshold is very high, which is fascinating. I didn't know they were quite so high. So really if we have a lot of informal, in some sense, operators, who are well below the personal income tax threshold. Well, why does that matter for tax purposes? That's not a, that's in some sense, that's not an issue. Um, maybe issues about social security. So I just, it's a kind of a bit of a plea to be a bit more precise for, as I say, it's a little bit of an obsession of mine when we talk about informality. I think also informality always makes you think, well, the problem is all these little traders out there, these small businesses, these tiny businesses, they're often not the issue for compliance. It can be, I imagine it's true in Latin America as elsewhere, it's as much the professionals um, who is, in what sense are they informal? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if describing a, a, you know, an, an architect who is simply not declaring their receipts, whether calling them informal is helpful or not. I rather, I rather doubt it is, but sorry, I get a bit passionate on that one. Actually, as an aside, I thought it was very interesting. And as I said, I didn't know about these very high thresholds because um, I've always had a sense that maybe high thresholds for the income tax are a good idea for many uh, lower capacity countries in particular. And of course, not all these countries are low capacity um, because you could argue that, well, maybe in, in some sense, as we've spread uh, tax systems around the world, maybe we've made a historic error by starting with the personal income tax as a mass tax. It wasn't a mass tax when it was introduced in the kind of um, the now advanced countries. And, you know, we've had sensible proposals from people like Mike Gratz for the US to have really a very high threshold um, and just keep people out of the income tax. Uh, and, um, you know, as we would recommend with the VAT quite often, think about starting with a high threshold and lowering it over time. So I thought that was a very interesting uh, set of thoughts prompted by the paper. Just a couple of other ones, and then I'll wrap up. Um, again, coming from my ignorant background, I always think of financial transactions taxes when I think about uh, Latin America. So, I, and there is mention of those, I would certainly be interested to learn more about those. You know, a conventional wisdom has often been that financial transactions taxes kind of fade away after a while. They come in and then people find ways around them and, and they disappear. That doesn't seem to be happening. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I would be curious to know a little bit more about uh, what's happening uh, on financial transactions taxes in the region. There are a couple of areas I think in which, you know, uh, well, going back a little bit, I think Daniel didn't have time to mention, but the paper sort of 
begins by referring to an IDB study of 2013 uh, and is asking in some sense, what has changed since then? Uh, and I guess there are a couple of things it might have been nice to know a bit more about as new developments since then. One, of course, is all the kind of um, Panama Papers and everything else leaks, which have led to quite a lot of work, uh, much of it on, on Latin America, on evasion um, and by the elite. So I'd be curious to, to learn a little bit more about what we've learned about, in particular, high-end avoid avoidance and evasion in the region uh, with these, um, uh, you know, with these um, revelations over the last few years, which there have been some, some quite interesting papers on that, uh, including some for the region. Um, and we've also had the kind of mature, well, movement towards maturity of these initiatives on uh, international exchange of information, AOI and all that. And I'd sort of be curious to know, really, is that making any difference uh, in Latin America? Can we, and I don't mean just in the kind of short term revenue recovery, but, um, you know, is there a prospect that these agreements actually will lead to more effective taxation of, uh, of high end uh, individuals? not just kind of what I mean kind of changes in policy that might be more feasible on the basis of the of the advances that we've seen in, um, uh, in, in information exchange. Um, of course, it'd be nice to know a little bit more, however, speculative about uh, performance of tax systems during COVID. I think um, and I realize that's going to be difficult, but it's I think one of the interesting things that seems to be emerging is that tax systems in a number of countries actually seem to have done quite a good job. Uh, in the COVID crisis in terms of delivering rapid, timely support of various kinds, even actually in some cases, maybe improving uh, trust in, in tax systems, which can be quite important looking forward. So I'd be interested to hear more about that experience, but perhaps I'll, uh, I'll, I think I'll just stop there. But as I say, it's, um, I'm just doing the usual discussions thing of asking for more. Uh, it's a very helpful and enjoyable paper. I don't have any great uh, difficulty with the recommendations. But you have to forgive me for my uh, obsession with this term uh, informality. So um, I'll leave it there. But thanks very much, Daniel, and your co authors. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Keen. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Christians to give her comments on the paper. Thank you so much, Saranjali, and so nice to see you, Professor Dr. Tendon, I mean, not Saranjali. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I also enjoyed the paper very much. So thank you uh, to the Global Tax Group for inviting me to read it. Uh, not, not an easy paper for me to read um, because like Professor Keen, I learned a lot from it, but also like <laughs> the, the passion of Michael uh, in his um, taking issue with the word informality. So, so I, I loved it when he said, I get passionate about that because he's very elegant in his passion. And I have been accused of being quite loud when I'm passionate about something. <laughs> so I love it when someone says they're passionate uh, in such, a, uh, such an understated way. Um, and I love the expression of that. So I really liked how the paper opened up, uh, that there was a book that it said, it, it sort of laid out a, a framework for uh, a group of countries, which uh, I think rightly uh, Michael noted, you know, your geographical grouping becomes some sort of economically interesting connection between countries that isn't actually real, just like they're geographically located. Uh, so we compare them often. So I, I understand that um, hesitation, but I liked the idea that there was this book. It laid out the framework and your um, a task that you and your co-authors gave yourselves was to update us and tell us, you know, have things gotten better? Um, so I really like that. And then I um, stumbled pretty quickly at the beginning of the paper to try to get my bearings around the word expenditures. Now I know that all of the economists uh, in the room will say, but it's Econ 101, uh, you know, I'm not going to put that in every paper I write. I'm not going to define this all the time. But the word expenditures is used in two ways in this paper. One is government expenditures, by which I take it you mean government spending. 
and one as tax expenditures, which by which I take it you mean spending by reducing the tax base or reducing the tax base, a rate on a specific uh, industry or taxpayer. And they're interchanged in some ways. They're, they're used interchangeably in some ways. And I found myself puzzled throughout, sometimes just having to catch myself and say, okay, well, which one uh, is being used here? And then I saw that you were mixed. Sometimes you were actually using government expenditures in the tax expenditure uh, context. And so then as a non-economist, you know, I truck in nothing but words over here in my legal, you know, box. So as an, as a non-economist, I uh, struggled with trying to keep on track of where the paper was taking me. And for that reason, I will commit the cardinal sin of uh, commenting on papers, and that is I will take issue at a specific footnote. Sorry. <laughs> and it's footnote nine. Uh, where I think this is the best uh, explanation that you give in the paper. I Perhaps you do it better somewhere else and I just missed it. Uh, but here you say tax expenditures were obtained from official data. But in the case of Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, and Uruguay, we subtracted from the official estimates some lines that do not create a fiscal loss for the government or would be part of a, quote, well-designed VAT. Uh, for example, reimbursement to exporters and exemptions in the VAT charged in inputs that would be paid by buying the firm later. Okay, so when I read that, I thought, okay, I really don't know what is being said here about the tax expenditures, like which, which definition, and I was started looking for, well, where's the annex that tells me the government official data of what a tax expenditure means? And where you um, changed that definition and and why? Like, what is it? What is that definition? And here's my rationale. So I know this is I know this is like going way too deep into something that this paper is not really designed to do. And in a sense, I, you have to just forgive me for that because as a lawyer <laughs> reading the paper, I obsess. This is where I obsess. Uh, just what are we talking about here? When you talked about exempting, per so I looked through and sort of tried to gather where you gave me clues about what kind of exemptions. And in one part, you talked about cash transfers to the poor, subsidized uh, pensions and subsidies for energy. Um, and then in another part, you talked about minimum exemption levels, and you talked about whether it would be feasible to lower those to increase progressivity or you know to get more revenues, but preserve progressivity. So in an income tax, that first zero rated band, I, I don't know why we would call that a tax exem, a exemption, a expenditure. Because that first zero rated band in an income tax in some way is a representation of the idea that you have to have some expenditures in order to produce any income at all. And we don't, itemize those when those expenditures are personal. Instead, we, we acknowledge that some amount of personal expenditure is necessary to sustain life, and therefore we have an exemption amount. Other, to do otherwise would be effectively to tax the, the vast majority of income earners who are earning income from wages. We would be taxing them on um, the their basic ability to provide services on a gross basis without any set off for the expenses, expenses that they have because we don't give, generally in an income tax, we don't give deductions for regular uh, personal expenses. So your house and your food and so on. And you, there's exceptions, right? But that's the idea of that first zero band is not that it's a giveaway or a tax expenditure, but that it is a proxy for some basic amount but for which people cannot trade their services in the market for income. So they can't earn income. And so it's a kind of a strange thing for me if you say that an exempt amount is an expenditure, like at the bottom. So that's just, that, that's kind of the flavor of my reading of it. Like I'm really fascinated by this discussion about the exemptions and there's so much analysis of 
the level and the degree and the type of expenditures. But I, at the end, I still struggled to know what we were talking about. And then, so, but that's, you know, again, I think that's just a vocabulary. I think this is a vocabulary that, that you probably have and you are clear and you know, and I just don't, I don't know. Um, and that makes it intriguing to me. So, because I think some different implications come out of the paper if I, if we have a discussion about what those expenditures are. And then I had a couple other um, points. I, I, uh, like Michael, I have my own um, red flags go up when people tell me things. So I've seen this argument before where, well, if you don't enforce, uh, you know, this system, this tax could be progressive if it's not enforced quickly. Like, you know, if we just don't enforce it on a certain group of people because we can't catch them because their compliance levels are low, you know, it turns out that it's more progressive than we thought. So I've seen this argument about that before. And there's something deeply disturbing about that, but I can't put my finger on it, right? And this paper brought that up for me again. Uh, yeah, the idea that, well, the VAT could be considered more progressive, uh, assuming away perfect, uh, perfect enforcement, you know, just assuming uh, some level of lack of enforcement. And there's something really problematic to, to, to me about this idea. Like, like, don't worry that your tax is completely regressive because, well, the government can't enforce it and uh, we're going to come along and do an analysis post Ex post that shows us that in the in the inability to enforce, uh, with surprise we we were more progressive than we intended to be. There's just something very you know very I struggle with that. Like I don't know how to read an analysis like that. Like it like what if next year so with surprise it's way more regressive than we thought. You know like I just don't know how to judge a tax based on those that kind of observation. So when you show that in this uh, paper, it's really, it's really intriguing to me. You know, it's an interesting problem. And I'll relate that problem to another uh, thing that I think I, I noticed in the paper, which is that you talked about equalization at one point, uh, you know, in terms of like uh, payments across different subnational uh, governments and you you in fact you mentioned Canada so of course you know when I saw Canada in the footnote I was like oh yeah I know what that is I know what equalization is but there wasn't a lot of discussion about that and I also looked for earmarking in the paper and you did mention earmarking at one point and I thought okay so some of the discussion about um, whether a tax is successful is tied to whether it's what it's spent on undoes the injustice or the unprogressive nature of the tax. And, and I just, I don't know what that means, honestly. I, I don't really understand that uh, idea as a conceptual matter, why, why it's so clear to economists that well, if I break it on the collection side, I'll fix it on the distribution side. Uh, so then it's good <laughs> together. Like as long as I, I might have a terrible tax system, but as long as I correctly spend it, uh, somehow fixing whatever ills I have created in the world that all will be well. And I got a strong sense of that here, that, that there was some of this underlying the data here. So I, I don't want to go too far into um, in further into that because for me I understand that this paper is about a, is an analysis of what is and and not necessarily what ought to be. So it's not a normative analysis. It's really showing me a snapshot of the world, which I appreciate and love really as a scholar. I love this kind of work. I'm so glad you do this kind of work and my reflections back to you are just to say like that's why I love the work because it just provokes me to to query what I know about or what I think about um, what tax systems are supposed to be good or not and what normative criterion I use to judge them so I really appreciate you doing that kind of work that provokes those questions and I just 
uh, like Mick, I like to ask for more. And for me, just more means, you know, help me the lawyer understand some of the um, some of the assumptions that have gone into the what makes something an expenditure and why why you see one as uh, correct and another as as needing a tweak as as you do in in footnote nine. Um, and then I'll just finish by saying um, that the, the one thing that was said earlier was about the leaks and the, the Panama Papers. And I had in my notes, yeah, what about FATCA? Like what happened after the US changed financial reporting? Does that have anything to say about the evasion story? So I just wanted to, uh, you know, echo that or affirm that I had that same question uh, of reading paper that I wondered about some different things that had happened in the world since 2013. FATCA was 2010, but didn't really sort of kick in until 2011, 2012, maybe. So maybe that I, I was sort of looking for that story in your story and didn't see it at all. I was actually surprised to not see it at all. Um, so I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing your comments and the questions of others on the panel. And thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, Daniel or Alejandro, would you like to sort of make quick comments in response to? Well, I will do it because Alejandro, unfortunately, was called from other meetings. So he wanted to listen to the comments by Michael and Alison, but he had to leave. Um, you want me to answer to, uh, to the comments now? Yes? As you tell me, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you uh, both you, Michael and Alison, for the comments. Uh, uh, let me uh, try to, I will go one by one uh, rapidly. Uh, first, uh, and the question about what is failure of success, Michael uh, commented. We discussed a little bit about Colombia and Costa Rica. The difference uh, is might be, uh, well, you know, Costa Rica tried to do a tax reform in the middle of a pandemic. I would suggest, I'm not a politician, but I would say that that's not the best idea. No? Uh, by trying to reduce exemptions in the DAT, the reform was relatively okay in my view, but okay, trying to do that, uh, these times is not probably the best thing to do. Costa Rica was the, ref the reform done in, uh, before the pandemic in 2019. Uh, and uh, they did, uh, uh, they had a long process of discussion of the reform uh, among uh, key stakeholders. And they uh, included uh, a reduction in, in, in government expenditures with a fiscal sustainability law that, that was passed and then uh, some increase in, in the income tax that make the reform progressive. So it was a combination of things that we'll discuss for a long period of time. So I would say that uh, maybe that's particular to Costa Rica, but they were able to go with that uh, successfully. But obviously I agree that uh, one thing is we have a relatively technocratic view. When we write the paper, my colleagues in the IDB that are in the, in the chief and the two other prominent uh, researchers there in the fiscal division, when they help countries in terms of tax reform, they, they obviously take into consideration the political restrictions, but there are political restrictions, okay? Um, then uh, in terms of, uh, when you say uh, uh, in terms of uh, blocking powers of some people, obviously, you know that in Latin America, and especially in the country I am of uh, Argentina, we had uh, more crisis than average in the developed countries, at least. Uh, and crises are usually good opportunities uh, because the blocking powers might be uh, lower than in other cases. Unfortunately, in Argentina, that was not the case. That's a case I know more uh, when we talk about crisis because in the big, uh, in the large big crisis, uh, the governments passed uh, the tax on financial transactions, they introduced those inefficient taxes have one advantage for the government. They are not very peaceable and they collect a lot of money. In Argentina, uh, the tax on financial transactions collects almost 2% of GDP and the Cascade Provincial Tax collects about 4.5% uh, of GDP. This, they are not visible. The people think that they are paid by business, although they are 
charge included in the end user prices. So in the end, uh, in crisis, you can have a possibility, maybe because the, the powers of the elites may be affected or changed, but that was at least not the case in Argentina. I, I, I agree with you that this uh, sustainability has to include everything. And you mentioned the difference between Chile and Ecuador. Uh, Chile has, uh, as you know well, uh, stabilization fund, the copper fund that provides them with a lot of room to maneuver in, in bad times. That's not the case in Ecuador, even though they are both rich in, 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 in commodities. Uh, so I think that that has, that obviously when you do our tax reform, you have to include also uh, sustainability on a macro sense. Um, the, what you suggest about clusters is okay, as you probably noticed in the paper, we, in the comparison in tax parts, we included uh, uh, all countries in the region, but when we uh, did the analysis of uh, the VAT income tax and other things in terms of incidents and other things, we put the emphasis on uh, on some countries that are not in the Caribbean, which are maybe different than the countries in South America or Central America. But in any case, the idea of working with cluster is something that uh, it, may, it, may, it may be very informative. In terms of informality, when I talk about informality, we use the traditional definition that is labor informality, people not making contribution to the social security system. Obviously, informality is uh, more important than that because, as you mentioned, there are small firms. Uh, and uh, and uh, maybe the fact that we have high informality explains why in some countries, we, especially those that have tax, high tax burdens, we abuse of those cascade taxes, but they are paid also by the informal things. When you, if the price of the goods includes the cascade tax, which I think is most likely a scenario that is paid also by the informal uh, firms or by the informal workers too. Um, the idea of the income tax is something that, uh, again, when, uh, I, I tend to agree with, uh, uh, when you put the emphasis in developed nations about the income tax might be different in Latin American economies. And there has and that maybe explains why the VAT, uh, in terms of design and collection, is similar to advanced economies, and that's not the case with the personal income tax. Uh, uh, when I, you have problems at the tax administration level, and also the what we call it inform informality, that makes the collection of the personal income tax more, more difficult, and also the collection of social security contributions more difficult. Uh, the financial tax in some countries was eliminated in the region, in some others uh, not, and in some countries came back, like it's the case of Argentina, Brazil, for example, repealed the financial transaction tax about a decade ago. In the cases that it, uh, it's maintained is because it collects a lot of money, as I mentioned with the example of, uh, of Argentina. Then you ask about what is the impact of the Panama Papers I, I've seen no, I've seen some professional papers about the impact of the Panama Papers uh, in Europe or in other countries, not in, uh, not in the region, maybe there are some, I will try to look at that. But going into something that uh, Alison also mentioned about uh, in, uh, FATCA and International Exchange of Information, I know of not, I do not know about papers who study this uh, rigorously, from an empirical point of view, because you have probably to look at tax forms and that requires access to them. And so you need the agreement with the tax agency. But I can tell you again what happened in Argentina. In Argentina, there was a tax amnesty, as we had many in the past, in 2016. And that was a particularly successful amnesty compared to, to the ones in the past, but much much more successful. And part of the explanation of why it was much more successful than that tax amnesty in the past has to do with this novelty, quote unquote, that uh, countries were uh, starting to interchange uh, uh, information. And obviously that convinced many people that it was better to, uh, to enter into tax amnesty, paying a penalty that was about 15% of tax due. And then from then the tax base of uh, income taxes and taxes on wealth that uh, are relevant in Argentina increase. Then um, when I, sorry, Alison, for the, for uh, my confusion about uh, uh, the writing, but let me uh, try to uh, clarify. Tax expenditures are basically uh, the loss of tax revenues that you have because you have an exemption, okay? 
they are called tax expenditures because to some extent they are alternatives to making uh, subsidy. For example, you subsidize uh, the production of tomatoes uh, with uh, money in the budget is to some extent similar than reducing the income tax that they have to pay. That's the reason why they are called tax expenditures, but they are different. They are similar to uh, 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 government spending, but uh, they are treated separately. In and footnote I, nine, I, I'm sorry, I, uh, there only, there's only one minute left if you could okay. just. I will go briefly. Uh, in, with, uh, in footnote nine, what we try to correct is in some countries, they exaggerate the tax expenditure because, for example, in the VAT, they consider tax expenditure exemptions in intermediate inputs and the revenue loss at that level is collected later. So it's not the tax loss for the government. And so we could detect that, we corrected that because if not the comparison across countries was going to be uh, very. And uh, another thing that is important, the minimum exempt level in the personal income tax in almost all countries is not included as a tax expenditure. Okay, so you can be sure that that's not part of what we included in the table. And uh, then the, on the Bashasa, we don't have comment to comment on the informality. I, I agree that sometimes a little bit queer, but in, this, in the end is saying that if, if informality makes the final price lower, then you cannot think that the VAT has that such or, or another impact on the consumer because in, in, a, in a sense, he, uh, the consumer is saving the money of the tax. Uh, and in our marking, we didn't discuss that. Uh, so, uh, and the fact I already comment when I addressed the, uh, the Michael's comments. So thank you both of you for the comments. And uh, I stop here because of time constraint. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. And there were two questions in the chat box. Uh, perhaps you can take those separately. And we wrap up this session. So thank you so much. Thank you. I think Surajali, you can go to the next question, but there was a question from Eduardo also for the previous, but we need to move it to the chat, I think, um, if you don't mind. Uh, but Surajali, uh, so the second session is the paper five, six, uh, will be presented. Uh, I have asked uh, Surajali to kindly help me with the share uh, because I have a cold, so not sure how it's going to go. So please go ahead, Surajali. Thank you so much, Irma, and uh, sorry for racing into the next session. Uh, I think it's it's an interesting discussion. We're going to have on who, who should tax multinationals. I think it's absolutely relevant uh, for where we are right now. Uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, the speaker, which is Vincent Aral Bandok, who who's at, uh, sorry, just a sec. Yeah, I'd like to invite him. He's uh, at, at the University de Montreal, Canada. We have two discussants, which is Michelle Kane at New York University and Peter Hongler, Hongler at St. Gallen University. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, could anyone give me a thumbs up for the, for the screen share? Yeah, great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Vincent Arel Bandoc. I'm an associate professor of political science at the University of Montréal. Uh, thank, thank very much, the organizer. I know these things are always more work to organize than we initially think, so I really appreciate your work. Uh, this is a paper joint work with my wonderful colleague, André Blais. Uh, I, I'm super excited to present it here because it is a paper we wrote with a, an audience of political scientists uh, in mind, but it'll be really interesting to, to hear what, what you all have to say because I think this is a more uh, diverse audience. So the paper is, is called Who Should Tax Multinationals? And it is about tax-based allocation. And it is a piece that is quite different from what we've heard so far, because it is a piece about public opinion on tax-based allocation, which, which is kind of a weird twist on the topic, I guess. Um, so the first thing I should say is, wow, uh, we live in interesting times. It is a particularly interesting time to study international tax law. Uh, for, uh, for a while, it felt like the only people who cared about this were the people in this room, uh, in this virtual room today, maybe some economists, some lawyers, maybe four political scientists in the whole world. Uh, but today it is different. Um, so just an anecdote, at home we, we still get a paper copy of the local newspaper. 
And my 13 year old daughter cares about nothing these days. She's the pure teenager. And yet she read an article about this in the newspaper and suddenly she was semi interested in my work, which was wonderful. Uh, so this is really something that used to be only for us and it now is now for them. So I think it's a great time to think about how public opinion plays into all this. And this is what we're, we're going to do in this paper. I think one of the reasons why this is a topic that resonates so much these days is this historical narrative that's been told around the, the big reforms that we're seeing these days. So in, in broad strokes, what we hear in the media and in think pieces about this is, is something like this. So in 1920, in the 20s of the League of Nations, these, these wise old men experts uh, the, the designed the system, right? And then, and then for a hundred years, there's nothing that happens in international tax law crickets. And then in 2021, we have the OECD that announces this massive, massive deal, right? The 140 countries, the inclusive framework and all that. So of course, all of us know that this is an incorrect account, or at least it's kind of a gross oversimplification, but it does highlight why this is such a massive deal in the public's perspective. It's presented as a big historical break and it's shown to be really inclusive. Um, the, the word inclusive framework is a play for legitimacy, right? It's a rhetorical, interesting, rhetorical trick, um, but it is a big deal. It is many, many countries that have uh, ostensibly agreed to, the, to this deal. So, so it's, a, it's a really big change. Now, even if it's a big change, and even if we have 140 countries, and even if we, we can legitimately say, wow, this is a big deal, there is still a question of representation here, uh, a question of democratic accountability that, is, that, it, that has to be raised. So on, on the one hand, many worry that some of these 140 voices were louder than others. And I know many in this room have expressed this worry uh, many times. But, but I think there's also this deeper question of representation. So even if the 140 voices were heard on, uh, at an equal volume, it's not clear that these voices actually represent the people that they are ostensibly meant to represent because international tax laws have been and are still, I think in 2021, designed in a very small epistemic community of experts technocrats, lawyers, accountants, economists, those who attend the symposium, basically. And, and the, the question that we ask here is, should we care about the views of a broader uh, uh, segment of the population? Should we care about the views of non-experts? And we answer yes in this paper. So we argue that public opinion on international taxation matters a lot. It matters for many reasons. So the first reason is really deeply political. My uh, uh, friend and colleague Frédéric Meran is a sociologist and he wrote this wonderful little book uh, published by, by Oxford uh, University Press recently. Uh, he, he did an embedded ethnography, spent several months in the cabinet of Pierre Moscovici and he has two chapters that are really, really uh, excellent about the internal, internal EU politics of international taxation. So I, I strongly recommend this. But one of the messages that really come out strongly from this, from this book is is that this whole reform was really conceived from the inside as, as kind of a left-wing response to this wave of right-wing populism that we're seeing in Europe and, and, else, and elsewhere. And so from that political perspective, it seems really clear that if politicians are designing these policies as a response to a public movement, then the policies need also to resonate in the population if they're going to have the effect that these politicians expect or hope. Right, and, and so there, there's a really deeply political uh, a reason to focus on public opinion on these matters, even if people are not experts, even if the, those policies are complicated and, and hard to understand. There's also, I think, uh, other arguments based on media. So, so a lot of media and tax justice advocates uh, advocates uh, really appeal to the public when they, they they ask for reform. There's an acceptability argument that we could make, and there's really the more fundamentally, I think, a really strong normative case to be uh, to be made that this this tiny community should not necessarily do policies for everyone. That there needs to be some democratic accountability, and that if elites like us, right, if we want to push through some complicated counterintuitive policies, then we must bear the burden of education. We have to explain our policies and we have to explain them in a way that, that makes sense to people. Even if they're complicated, we have to make the effort. So th th these are the reasons that motivate our study here. Public opinion matters, it should matter, and I think it, it does practically. 
Okay, so I want to narrow the scope a bit. I've talked about international law, general, international tax law generally, but but there's these two related but distinct distributional conflicts that we can separate, right? Uh, so how much we tax? So there's this big pile of money, right? And the government wants to put its hands on it, and and we want to determine how much should we tax. That's the level of taxation, and there's a massive literature in political economy about that, right? We have all these papers about the determinants of tax policy, the race to the bottom, the different preferences for redistribution. Like, should we tax capital or labor? What do people think about that? So we know a lot about this, but we don't know a lot about the second aspect in political science, at least. We, it's really critically understudied. So, so today I'm not going to, uh, to present a new theory of taxation. I'm going to try to answer the who collects taxes, the allocation part, and what do people think about the, the allocation part? So we established some key facts about uh, public opinion on tax-based allocation. All right, so tax allocation is salient among the elites. I have two quotes by finance ministers here who say that their country should get more tax revenues and that other countries should get less. Um, and in this paper, we look at the same question, but from a ground up uh, uh, perspective of public opinion. All right, so here's the, the too long did read on, um, on the empirics here. We're going to ask two empirical questions. The first one is pretty simple, right? Can normal, in quotes, people express consistent views and intuitions about a complex topic like this? Our answer is gonna be yes. Um, and if so, what are those intuitions? And so the methods is we're going to run a large scale survey. So 6,000 people in, in total in Brazil, France, and the US. We're going to embed randomized experiments in these surveys in order to probe respondents' intuitions about simplified tax-based allocation schemes. So those are not going to be exactly what you, what the lawyers here have in mind, but they're going to be close enough that we, we, we feel like we can draw something on it uh, from them. And the results are going to be this. So first of all, market-based tax allocation. So allocating the tax base to market jurisdictions, super popular. People love this. Uh, the digital services tax, people love this as well. Allocating the tax base based on the location on the, of the headquarter for the, the parent company, people hate this. That's not good. Um, and then fourth, there's going to be a home bias. So people are going to want to allocate more revenues to their own government. So there's some kind of nationalism involved, which is not super surprising. And then fifth, results are really consistent both across countries and across studies, which again gives us more uh, confidence uh, about this point, number one here on the left, that normal people can express consistent, reasonable uh, views on this. All right, so the surveys, like I said, 2000 people per country. These three countries are different. They all have multinationals, so that's good. That's needed for, for our design, uh, but they're, we argue, meaningfully different. They have different places in the, in the world economy, right? Brazil is not the same as France. France is not the same as the US. They're different politically as well, so they're, we, we feel they're, they're a pretty good uh, a selection of countries. Um, and we're going to have three different studies, two experiments, and one where we just directly elicit, uh, elicit the, the preferences of people. All right, so experiment number one looks like this. So this is, this is very similar. Essentially, the goal here is to find out what weight people put on each factor of the formulary apportionment formula, right? So you think of sales, capital, and labor. How much do people value each of these factors? So, so we're going to present companies with random characteristics. We're going to describe these companies with a, a bunch of bar graphs like this, histograms. Um, and and these, these features of this company are going to be uh, randomized. So we explain to people how to read this graph. It, it's not so complicated once you explain it a bit. And, and the idea is that some companies are going to be headquartered in the US, others in Brazil, others in France. Some people are going to have a lot of employees in Brazil and others in the US. And, and then what we're going to ask people to do is allocate a fixed amount of tax revenues to the three countries. We're going to say this company has $10 million or euros or, or whatever to, to pay in total in the world. And we're going to ask people to say, how much should each country get, each government get? Um, and so, so people can go to the graph and say, oh, look, this company has a lot of employees in Brazil. Therefore, it should pay most of its taxes in Brazil, right? And, and then choose. And so this gives us uh, three numbers per company because they have to allocate taxes to Brazil, France, and the US. Um, and we're going to repeat this task four times. So we're going to show uh, four hypothetical companies to people, and they're going to, to rate each, uh, they're going to allocate the taxes for, for all four companies. 
So in the uh, statistical uh, uh, linear regression framework, that's going to give us a data set with uh, the unit of analysis that's a respondent country task. And so, so that's like 12 rows per, uh, per respondent. Um, okay, so, so this is the, the empirical analysis. We're going to estimate a simple linear regression uh, model where, so S is sales, labor capital, that's the location of the home, uh, uh, the headquarter, pardon, and this is the home bias. So the home bias is a variable that's a dummy variable that's equal to one when uh, we're asking respondent to allocate income to their own government, right? So this measures the level of nationalism, basically. So, so these are the, the confidence intervals that we, we estimate. We estimate different models per country. And so we have a number of findings that are really interesting here. The first one is that people are biased toward their, towards their home. I said this already, this is nationalism. So people allocate about a 10th more revenues to their own government, controlling for everything else, all right? So, so we want to grab the revenue. Second, the location of the headquarter does not matter at all. So you look at you look at this thing here. So it's statistically significant, but the coefficient is so small that it makes no difference essentially. So people don't care where the parent company is. They want to allocate revenues for other reasons. Uh, the third important uh, finding here is that the sales location matters a lot. So people find it very intuitive to allocate revenues in the countries where companies make sales. So this is the last coefficient here. You see that the bar is really much farther in all three, in all three graphs. So the sales location is really important for people. And also finally, the, the results are near identical across countries, which is I think super interesting for the, the prospects of international cooperation on this. I'll come back to this point later. Okay, so second question, second study is a, a direct elicitation study. So basically what we, we were wondering and, and worried that people would just an, answer randomly, right? Maybe this is, this task is too complicated. They don't answer the graph. They don't understand the graph and they just click on whatever on the survey, right? So what we did is after we did the first study, we just asked them straight up directly. The amount of taxes that a multinational company pays in different countries where she does business should depend first and foremost on sales capital or the location of the headquarter. And what we see in this graph is that, so the green, the green here is the share of people who rank sales first. So, so we see that almost 75% of people in Brazil think that sales is the most important criterion. And if you put the, the green and the yellow ones together, you see that it's overwhelming. People think that sales is so much more important than the rest that it's uh, it's, it's almost comical. Um, anyway, the, the point is when we do the task that's randomized, we arrive at the results. And when we just ask them uh, directly, we arrive at the same results. So this gives us more confidence in the initial uh, finding. Okay, uh, third study is about the digital services tax. This is, this is a bit different, obviously. Um, but the idea here is that we start off by introducing the DST. We say ju just a, a sh very short blurb about this is a tax that is meant to address situations where a firm doesn't have a physical presence and yet many users in the country and because of that doesn't end up paying any corporate income tax or very little. So this is the mo we just give them the motivation for the, for the tax and then we ask them on a scale of zero to 10, I believe, um, how much they like, they like the tax, right? So, so in the control group, they see nothing else. So this allows us to give us a, just a baseline measure of the level of support for the idea, right? And then we have two treatment groups that are randomized. So, so a third of the people will see a counter argument uh, to the DST that has to do with industry discrimination. So, so a lot of people have argued that these taxes are bad because um, they, they, they uh, single out digital firms, and this is not fair. So this is one counter argument that we present. And then the second counter argument that we present is a location discrimination. So the idea is that uh, most of the big digital firms are American, so this is not good for the US. So obviously we were, we were expecting that this location discrimination argument would have a strong effect in the US and maybe not elsewhere, right? If we tell respondents in the US that, that their country is being, their firms, their champions are being discriminated against, then we would expect them to like the DST less. But in fact, this is not what we find. So uh, the first thing is that the respondents in all three countries seem to love the DST. So if, if you look at the strongly favorable and the somewhat favorable, this is the, the green plus the yellow line, 
uh, uh, bars. This is almost 75% in France. It's, it's crushing. Everyone loves the DST. Um, and so it's really overwhelming support for the stacks that uh, uh, very few experts seem to actually like. Um, so this is interesting. Uh, and then the other interesting thing is that we, we have all the treatments, the controlled and the two treatments on different rows here, but all the graphs look the same. So our treatments have essentially no effect. Uh, and even in the US, the location discrimination thing doesn't, doesn't really make a difference. So, so if we, if we squint, re, squint really hard, maybe we see something, but it, there, there's, I mean, there's, there's nothing substantive there. Okay, so in summary, uh, the results are really consistent, both across countries and studies, uh, which is really interesting to us. Uh, Market-based tax allocation is a big deal, is great for people. The DST also, headquarter-based allocation is not popular, and there are some hope bites. So what? Uh, we have three so what's. The first one on market-based allocation. So this is really one score for all these allocation mechanisms that people have been proposing, right? So, so the destination-based cash flow tax, the, the sales-based formulary apportionment where all, where all the weight is on the sales, uh, and then maybe DSTs, which obviously is not exactly the same, but is, is in my mind kind of related. Um, so I, I think with this paper, uh, proponents of the destination-based cash flow tax can now go out and say, this is a tax that would be well understood by the public, easy to understand, and that is really compatible with their, their intuitions. And I think that that's a really big deal because we have these complicated policies that people are, are afraid to, to even try to understand, but we can explain this one in simple terms and people react positively to it. So I think for me, this is a really uh, a strong argument in favor of these tags beyond the efficiency arguments, beyond the redistributive components and everything. Uh, second thing is that the headquarter-based allocation is super unpopular. So, so when you read all these articles, this is the first one that popped up on, on Google, but, but you read things like it found that Starbucks had made $3 billion in UK sales since, since 98, but paid only 1% in, in corporate tax. So like a lot of people in the room, we don't like this juxtaposition of the sales and then the corporate, right? There's, there's something weird about this, but this kind of argument is mobilized all the time. And, and I think this really raises an important question about pillar two, which is really parent headquarter based, right? So we can really ask the question of whether normal people will stop getting angry when they hear stories like this. And, and if the response is, well, they pay more taxes in the parent country, I'm not sure this will satisfy people given the results that we found. So I think this is a really important uh, uh, outcome of this. And then third, there's really uh, interesting uh, conclusions about international cooperation here. So the good, the good part is that citizens of all three countries very much agree on this. They, they all find that the criteria uh, that, that are uh, intuitive and good are the same, which is encouraging. The bad is that there's home bias. So we all want our own government to extract more than others, uh, which is not surprising, but it's still dispiriting. And then uh, the ugly, well, well, this is, are these things really even going to be implemented? But that's, that's out of the scope of this, this one paper. Um, so thank you very much. I, I really look forward to your, your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Vincent. I think it's a fantastic look at uh, the, the way people think about uh, taxes, especially digital services tax. Uh, I, I'd like to invite Professor Mitchell Cain now uh, to give his comments. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the paper, Vincent, and the opportunity to comment on it. I was struck by your slide where you had the juxtaposition of the what question and the to whom question, uh, suggesting that one question was much asked and the other not so much. Uh, and then you did with a, a tag say, at least for political scientists. So that latter question of who is why I entered this field 25 years ago. It's the, the question that has always fascinated me and why I started studying international tax as opposed to domestic tax. So it's just a fascinating insight to uh, see the perspective from your discipline. And it's wonderful that social scientists are taking on this question and presenting in a forum such as this one and sharing your insights. And hopefully we can repay the favor and uh, give you something useful from the more technical side. 
I was going to divide my comments in, into two pieces. So first, I was going to say something about the general question of popular opinion and how that is relevant or not to the setting of tax policy. And then second, I'll give some more detailed comments on survey design and part maybe sharing some useful information uh, on the more uh, technical aspects. So first off on popular opinion, I was really excited just when I uh, was assigned this paper to comment on and picked up the abstract and thought, oh, this is great. This is something that has always fascinated me, which is of what relevance is popular opinion in this highly technocratic area uh, that I work in. Your focus is obviously on international tax and the taxation of multinationals, but it seems to me you can't really leap um, to that question, especially if you're approaching it as a political scientist or political theorist without asking the predecessor general question, which is to what extent does popular opinion ever matter when we are setting tax policy? And that obviously can arise in the wholly domestic, domestic setting as well. So there's an obvious reason to say it shouldn't matter, that it's, it's highly technocratic, it's complicated, uh, and people are gonna get it very wrong. Uh, at which point people might say, oh, well, isn't that an elitist view to take? And isn't that convenient for a tax law professor to assert the dominance of his own views and, and suggest that right, the mere laity can't um, participate in this? And yet, uh, accepting the charge of elitism, let's go outside of our own field, and I'll suggest there's certainly areas where we probably get almost um, universal consensus in this meeting that we'd like to defer to the technocrats. So if there are popular intuitions that are skeptical of climate change, we'd say, well, I hope the climate scientists win the day and we get international accord on reducing carbon emissions. If there are vaccine skeptics, we might say, wow, I hope the public health experts win the day and we get right wider spread vaccine mandates, et cetera. So there's certainly complicated areas where we think, oh boy, we, we have to beat down popular uninformed sentiment and, and let the experts set the policy. Uh, so is tax law different? And uh, if so, how is it different? So you had a slide that gave your reasons for why you think it matters. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, with, uh, take the liberty of lumping it into maybe two uh, broad categories, which I, I think covers your argument. So one is you wanna say uh, a combination of it's salient to um, citizens and people, so they care, and politicians care about that salience because the, they want to enact policy. And then you have a, a further reason, which is, wow, and isn't this great? Isn't this fortuitous? People actually get it right here. So it's not one where people get it miserably wrong. So just to quote on page 14, you say, uh, this suggests that international taxation may be a policy area where the intuitive dispositions of people are fortuitously compatible with the efficiency-based arguments of economists. So that's just like a great state of the world when the uninformed happen to lock into the right view um, from a more technocratic um, focus on the question. But let me uh, throw a, a one wrench in that and suggest a problem, which is that if we're gonna defer to intuitions on your question that you're interested in, it does raise the question about what about intuitions generally? So you know, why aren't we looking at intuitions um, you know, across the board. So you, that was very dear. I, I, I maybe can tell me in the chat or offline how in the world you've got a teenager interested in, in your area of work. Uh, but you did suggest, right, something about uh, you said your daughter, 13 year old, and you know, what's in the popular space here is something about those darn multinationals should pay their fair share. But that is in tension with basic, you know, public finance orthodoxy. Uh, which would say, actually, we you know, ought not to be taxing mobile capital at all, you know, unless we can design a tax to capture rents. Uh, if we tax mobile capital, it's going to be distortionary for various reasons. Public finance economists tend not to like corporate taxes generally. And so there are a whole slew of intuitions on this no, right, big, bad, rich multinationals need to pay their fair share, which are going to kind of butt up against what uh, you know, public finance economists uh, think uh, is sound policy um, in a technocratic sense. So that seems worth um, considering. 
Secondly, let's talk about a, a second sort of argument you give, which is you know, not about um, salience or political expediency. It's about political theory and democratic legitimacy. So that's interesting. And you know, I think you're saying here the uh, tax matters. And if it's the domain of the high priests and the technocrats, then we have a kind of democracy deficit because people uh, that are affected by it are not meaningfully participating in it. And the thought I had there is, uh, you know, you don't dig into this much in the paper, and it, you know, I think it, there's not space for it. You know, you uh, obviously are focused on the survey design and the results, but there is a, a predecessor problem there about how domestic democratic legitimacy is actually relevant in an international space. So, I, you know, most international tax scholars take a, a fairly realistic, real politic approach to international tax, where it's a, it's a power dynamic and countries negotiate for what they can. I actually push against that. You know, in my scholarship, I've tried to argue that there are meaningful normative constraints on what uh, countries can and ought to grab in international tax negotiations. But I can tell you every time I present that line of research, it's generally an uphill battle in a hostile audience uh, that I face. So. Uh, as a political scientist and theorist, you might you know, dig deeper into how to think about right legitimacy when we're thinking about inputs in a democratic space, like, okay, what's the progressivity of a domestic income tax system uh, versus now we're up and running as nation states and we just have a power dynamic. Is it the same, same sort of issue? Let me uh, shift to my second set of comments then, which is a little narrower on uh, questions of uh, survey uh, design and project design. So we have three points here, two a bit more technical and then one uh, a bit more general. So the technical ones are just meant to kind of share my perspective as a, a tax lawyer on aspects that I thought maybe the survey design didn't fully capture uh, the way the, the law exists in the book. So the first one is about the relevance of transfer pricing to the overall set of questions here. And here, this is a, a decision you've made, which is not unique uh, to the social scientists. I think you know, tax lawyers and scholars often do the same thing, uh, which is to focus uh, in the first instance on the multinational firm and on the question of transfer pricing. Why? Because that's where the bulk of economic activity uh, is in the current global economy. That's obviously the focus of, of uh, pillar one and pillar two. And yet it is important to, to remember that as, as a conceptual matter, the multinational firm and transfer pricing is not the conceptual baseline. The conceptual baseline is the unrelated party. And of course, there are the slew of uh, articles that are difficult to count at this point, you know, uh, suggesting the conceptual frailty in comparing the uh, related case to the unrelated case. And yet, the unrelated case continues to exist in the world. We need answers to how to allocate tax base when unrelated parties do operate at arm's length. And as long as we maintain some approach of an arm's length standard, some concept of transfer prices, a conceptual matter, that is the baseline, right? We, we, we have that. And so it's worth, I think, probing intuitions about what do people say? If I just have you know, a company building stuff in state A and no subsidiaries, no related parties, just selling to you know, consumers in state B, um, what, what are the intuitions there? You know, stripping out the multinational firm. Um, that, that could be relevant and important. Second point is, uh, again, a technical one about the, the relevance of headquarters. So this kind of shows up uh, uh, crucially in your second study, where you just ask directly on how would you allocate it based on these four factors. So I can see why you built it around headquarters, but it, it's also worth noting that from a, a technical matter, uh, I think lawyers would think not so much about headquarters as about residence. And it is true that we often think about the headquarters jurisdiction being the same as the residence jurisdiction. And in many, many cases, the residence jurisdiction will have the power to tax just in case the headquarters are there. But from the standpoint of, of doctrine, 
residence jurisdiction uh, contemplates not just taxation where headquarters are, but also taxation where ownership is, okay? So that is key to the basic intellectual property migration structures that have driven you know, much of BEPS in the first place is just take Apple, right? Okay, we, where's the headquarters? The US. Where's the IP we care about? It is not in the US. What is the theory of, of taxation of that IP? Well, if it's in a low tax jurisdiction that's not taxing it, that is actually residence-based taxation, right? The theory would be you have some corporate subsidiary, we're taxing you on a residence basis, and you own IP, you're earning royalties, that would be the theory of how you could tax it. And then the haven or low tax jurisdiction chooses not to exercise that jurisdiction. But ownership is really a kind of discrete factor from headquarters. And it would be interesting to probe that intuition, either through your study one or your study two, if you said something, and, and IP isn't really discreetly in your setup, right? You just have equipment, you know, there's like embedded IP, but you might want to try to break the IP out as the structures have actually done. What do people think about that? I mean, we know what the experts think about it. They think, okay, ownership of IP in the Caymans shouldn't matter. Um, if we strip you know, the pejorative of the Caymans or tax haven out of it, what do people think about ownership of assets? You know, and, and you can imagine structuring a study where it's a tangible asset and people might think ownership is important, right? And even in your study, you pick up some of that because there is ownership of factory and equipment um, is, is picking up stuff. Um, last point I just want to mention is about a survey design and this very interesting finding you have about uh, people kind of coalescing on sales, you know, arguably the most important finding of the study. And you have this really interesting observation where you say, you know, if you're skeptical, you say like, okay, people don't know what the hell they're talking about. Well, then in study two in particular, we should expect some randomization. If people are completely clueless and we you know, do it randomized, why are they coalescing on sales? So people must know something, but what do they know? I really want uh, to see you dig deeper on what exactly they know. And so I can imagine some counter stories that it would be nice to rebut in further studies and in, uh, as you test the robustness of these findings. So it's possible that people are just more familiar with sales-based taxation and corporate income taxation. So in the US, I'm always paying sales taxes on a transactional basis in countries with the VAT. People understand VATs cover sales. So maybe there's just like a deep misunderstanding about sales taxes versus sales of the formulary factor under the income tax. And because people are familiar with sales tax, they say, okay, sales, but it's just noise, right? You're not really picking up any kind of meaningful, insightful intuition about sales-based apportionment under an income tax. I also had a little concern just about the vocabulary, like sales is a common colloquial word. So if you said like, how often does a, a typical person use the word sale uh, in their ordinary speech versus how often do they use the word capital uh, or even labor? Um, or headquarters. So, you know, the, these are design features I worried a little bit about, you know, alternate explanations. And, you know, you're picking up something. And so maybe the result is not as strong, but as a reader, uh, it was, it surprised me. And so I was left thinking, are there alternate explanations? And uh, as a kind of um, empirical study survey design, I kind of wanted the next step to rebut some of those. All right, I'll stop there to preserve time for Peter and, um, uh, responses. But thanks again. Really interesting paper. Thank you, Professor Keane and Peter. Over to you. Thank you, and thank you, Mitchell, and thank you, Vincent, for, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation and your interesting paper. I, I try to be brief, also looking at the time I have. Uh, now, first of all, I, I really appreciated your approach, and I've done basically the same in my classes in a in a short, you know, in a in a smaller group uh, over the past uh, five to ten years that I have asked my students always in the first lesson, and um, how would they, you know, allocate the uh, the income um, of a multinational? 
Uh, and you know the result is, is is really surprising that the normally on average I get thirty percent to the market state as well. And um, so that's that's interesting to see. Now I, I want to focus on on uh, the survey uh, design. And for me, um, three questions are: I'm not a political scientist, so I, I'm a lawyer. Uh, just that you know that <laughs> you might you know not take me serious in in certain areas. So the three questions are are for me really important when designing a um, new survey. The first one is. How detailed is the fact pattern? And I think Mitchell has you know, brought that up as well. So how detailed are you when you ask your, um, uh, your peers um, with respect to the fact pattern? And, and here, of course, you, you, in your paper, you have something in the appendix, but for a reader, it was, it was very brief and maybe too brief that I really understood what they saw. And so you start, for instance, with the Zara example. Uh, is it everything they have seen or not? Because for me as a reader, I can then challenge you know some of the results, and, and because I can challenge um, that it was appropriate uh, what, what you showed them. Second of all, how do I make sure that it, I disclose enough technical details? And then, um, and here one very important point, and um, what is completely missing in in your interviews is is the incidence, the incidence both of the corporate tax and uh, the digital service tax, and you know. Uh, Listening to your presentation, I think you use your interview survey to make political suggestions. And if you do that, I think you have to be fair in the sense that, you know, the people interviewed need to understand who is going to pay the digital service tax and who is going to pay an um, additional corporate income tax, for instance, through a formulary system. And here, you know, economic literature is not clear, of course, but, you know, there is a clear tendency that the consumers will definitely pay a large part of the digital service tax. And I, I would be very interested to see, um, you know, if you show um, uh, this to uh, some of the people around the world, whether they will change the result and uh, whether they will change their answer. And I'm pretty sure they will. And uh, so if I, for instance, am in favor of a digital service tax without knowing that I'm going to pay half of it, I think things will change if I know that I'm going to pay half of, of, of such tax. So, so I think that's really key. And if, if you're going to do and, and political suggestions, and I think this is, is the goal of, of your research. research. And the third um, element of, of your survey design relates uh, to how do you phrase the fact pattern? And, and maybe if, if I'm allowed, and I just share, um, you know, what's, what's in the annex. And um, can you see, uh, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So that's basically what, what, what you showed them with respect to the digital service tax experiment. And then it says, in general, companies only pay corporate taxes in countries where they have employees or equipment. Digital companies often do business in countries where they have no employees or equipment. And I think that so far, that's a fair statement. That's descriptive. That's not, you know, going to influence their answers. And then you continue, this means the digital company like Facebook can have millions of users in a country that, but pay no corporate income tax in that country. I don't know whether that's, that's a good idea to use Facebook, first of all, and second of all, to use millions. Because basically you're pushing um, the people into a direction of, you know, saying, well, you know, millions of users, no tax. Of course, there should be a tax. Um, but... What you want to do is you want to ask, uh, you know, these people whether sales should be of relevance and not whether, you know, we should pay Facebook <laughs> because they have million users in our account. So I think that's a bit delicate here. Um, and, you know, and biases and, and impartiality, I think, is important. And while doing such a survey, I think we, we need to be as objective as possible. But again, I'm not a political scientist. So... I would have no idea how to design such a service. A, a, a survey. I'm just giving you some of my personal opinions here. And then you continue, and that's pretty interesting. You you argue there, or at least you, you describe, some governments argue that this situation is unfair. I mean, basically, you're giving them the argument already that this is unfair. And I tend to believe that if I read such a sentence, that I will reply, Oh, it seems to be unfair, so we need to change something. So I think there is some subjective element, uh, and which I would say should not be part of the survey. Um, 
Yes, so these are, are the three questions that I had uh, with respect to the survey design. You know, how detailed are you with respect to the fact pattern? How do I make sure that I disclose enough technical details? And I think it's absolutely necessary to, to talk about incidents. So who is going to pay for and the digital text? And last, how do I phrase my questions to be you know, as objective as uh, possible? Because I, I think your paper is really strong on the, on the home country bias. And I think that's something also some other scholars have highlighted already. If we want to achieve a just uh, international text regime, we need to step out of our boots as representing, you know, a small country, a large country, a rich country, a poor country. And, and again, I mean, your results show that you know, we have these biases. So we have to try to get rid of these biases. And, you know, there uh, philosophers agree with us. You know, for instance, Adam Smith said with the impartial spectator uh, perspective from, or Amartya Sen as well, with impartiality and, and reasoning, uh, but also John Rawls with his original position, where you don't know where it will end up <laughs> after a political uh, debate. So I think that's, that's there that the, the paper is, is, is very strong. And um, now, from a technical perspective, I just have a, a small comment. Uh, you know, the argument is that. That basically the result here aligns with uh, the opinion among uh, political economists and, and, and in particular with the efficiency principle. Uh, so a sales-based um, allocation would be efficient and therefore the result seems to be persuasive. I think you know more recent studies maybe also from non-economists show that efficiency might be the wrong normative goal at an international level. But the main reason for that is domestically it works because Efficiency means you know the pie is growing, and uh, domestically you have the possibility to share it. At an international level, well, the pie can grow, but we have no option to share it. So efficiency as a normative goal of the international uh, tax regime uh, is, I mean, personally, I think it's not the strong um, position. Now, um, let's do maybe a short outlook uh, at what you know could be of interest in the future, because I really think there is a need for such research. And you write one sentence in your um, conclusion, which was very interesting uh, to see, or in your uh, section on limitations and future work, you write the research community should now ask why market based taxation is so intuitively appealing to non specialists. And I think there, you know, it would be really interesting to see why, and I think Mitchell has also highlighted that why do people believe that market based taxation is fair? And therefore, I would believe that it might make more sense in the future not to use, let's say, the morally loaded discussion about the taxation of multinationals, because that debate is morally loaded in the sense, you know, political opinion is done, political narrative is that we should tax them higher and they should pay more. And, and therefore, we might lose, uh, you know, uh, uh, the link uh, uh, towards the, the real question here. And the real question is whether, you know, markets should get a higher share or not. And, and I think that's my comments also looking at the time. And then we still have some you know, time for you to respond. Thank you again for this very interesting presentation of the paper, which I really appreciate. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I agree with most of the comments. Just wanted to also ask Vincent that, you know, uh, testing for priors of, of people who respond may perhaps be a good way to really sit thinking about taxes of people you you know based, uh, ask these questions to. Uh, I, I bring bring it back to you, Vincent. You can respond to the comments made. And the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, this is really wonderful. So so many uh, useful comments. I won't I won't respond to everything, but I do want to to give a few things. So Peter, uh, yeah, the too brief description. I think that's that's right, but it's so difficult to write short answers. People speed through these surveys, so it's really a, a difficulty with the methodology. So at the end, we have results, but I think we have to keep in mind the limits of this approach. And I we're aware of it, and I think you've put the you you've put your your finger on it. That that's right, but we 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 have to make compromises. So we did the best we could. Uh, the incidence trade-offs, super interesting. And I think from an inferential perspective, we really want to isolate these different pieces. But for a future study, I think uh, exploring these trade-offs is, is totally the right approach. And that's something that I, I want to explore in future work. Um, the framing of the DST is too positive. Perhaps I, I, I am worried about this. I think, uh, I think you're right. 
but what we did try to do with this thing is, for, first of all, it's really hard to explain this thing in a short paragraph uh, in general. But second, we tried to match the, the um, arguments made by politicians. So we took a bunch of them and we, tr we tried to distill them in some kind of a prototypical argument. So it is morally loaded. You're, you're right, there's a the word fair. So it might stack the deck in favor of liking the DST, but also the counter arguments don't change it so much. So all this to say that we tried to model the speech of politicians, which maybe was not the right approach, but I, I'm sensitive to you to your concern. And I think yeah, it's, it's a valid one. Um, uh, uh, Mitchell, what the, the, so much stuff. This is this is really wonderful. Um, so I'm not sure what to I, I have all these notes. Uh, so the, the two the the the, the Translation between domestic legitimacy and international legitimacy is an interesting one. And to add to the complexity, there's also the strategic nature of it. So I think there, there is the pitch, as you noted, it's very short and it was really for motivation. And the, at the start, the, the study doesn't focus on this. So we do couch it in terms of legitimacy, but there's also the strategic nature of it, right? So there's, in political science, we have all this literature about the two level games and how the, the international negotiations are constrained by the, the, the relationships of the at the level one. And, and I think this is something we should integrate more into this and, and think more seriously about. Uh, your point uh, about the our starting point being the unitary firm and this not uh, not comporting to actual law is, is a good one. Uh, it's, it's, it's something I'll, I'll have to, um, at least uh, at the very, I mean, the studies conducted, right? And we've done the surveys. So, so, but what we can do is make very clear this background in the framing of the paper. And I think we have to be much more transparent about this. Uh, your point about ownership, the, it was very difficult for us to explain all this in a very short survey. Uh, but I, I, if I had to do it again, ownership is such a good word that it, it definitely should have been in there. So I, that's one decision I, I really regret. Um, uh, that's a really good one. The, the, so what do we know from this people? May, maybe this is because people are more familiar with sales, but in a sense, I, 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 I kind of don't care about the origin of this for this paper, right? So what we know now is that people react favorably to an allocation system based on sales. Now we can write another paper that says, why is it sales? But for, for the time being, we know that sales is really important. And if politicians want to push a different system, then they, they will probably have to make more efforts to convince people that it, it makes sense. So from a practical perspective, it's it's kind of uh, immaterial, but of course the, 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 the strategy or the, the, the explanation will have to be different based on the reasons that motivate people to focus on sales. So this is a good point, but I think for, for, for uh, uh, maybe another paper, your point about sales being more coll colloquial uh, is, is a, a, a real worry though. And I, I'm not sure what to think about that. Um, but uh, I, I've noted everything and I'll, I'll think about it more because there, there's a, a, a lot of meat here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vincent, Peter and Michelle for all the comments and the discussion. I think it was uh, extremely fascinating. Uh, Irma, we have enough time, uh, I guess, to take a comfort break. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box. No, there is a question from Eduardo, I believe, but no in the chat, but oh. here they raised his hand, yeah. And yes. Jerome as well, yeah. Okay. Eduardo. Eduardo, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Vincent, for, for such a, a, an illuminating paper. I have a, a small comment regarding the, the countries you are using as a sample. You are focusing on US, Brazil, and France. So you are fundamentally focusing on large market jurisdiction from the West. So I wonder if it would be convenient to, to focus on, on uh, uh, I could say, um, smaller jurisdictions that basically export all what they produce. I'm thinking of Thailand, Ghana, Chile, Denmark, in order to, to make your analysis truly global. And ideally, I think it should represent all continents, not just a three large market jurisdictions from, from the West. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. Thanks, Edouard. Jerome, you could make your comment. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a, a very interesting paper and uh, quite novel uh, for an approach uh, for me. Uh, but in a sense, it uh, kind of confirms a few, a few uh, uh, thoughts that I've been having lately, which are that uh, sim the power of symbols. Symbols are 
uh, importance in our societies. I think they will become more, even more important in the future. So this is uh, what you describe is a, is a is a response basically to the uh, the importance of uh, those symbols. And I think we'll see more of that in uh, other fields. Uh, we we we've seen from the OCD report on the inheritance taxes. They might uh, do kind of come back uh, in a few countries. Wealth taxes might be. Uh, coming back in a few countries, they're always discussed in countries that uh, uh, got rid of them a few years ago, uh, it's being discussed again. So I think it, it confirms uh, the idea that symbols uh, are getting uh, more important. Then just a second point uh, on the, um, uh, the fact that DST seems very popular. Well, you can understand that because uh, uh, it's a tax that adds basically to the, the, the tax burden. Uh, it's a new tax in the country of destination and in the country of origin, well, Perhaps you might deduct it as a cost, uh, probably no facility to credit it. So and not, not even the country of origin will, will lose in terms of, of revenues. Uh, but of course, if you take the broader picture, the, the tax may be uh, passed on uh, to the to consumers. So uh, in the end, uh, uh, it, it may not be a, a favorable uh, solution in, this, in that respect. So uh, it perhaps shows uh, in a way the, the, the limits of these uh, the, the conclusions we may draw uh, on these uh, these studies, uh, which are that if you take the broader pr perspective, uh, it's uh, it's um, there are always effects, and I think Peter was also uh, in uh, into this uh, the, this track. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. And I think we have another comment by the other Eduardo. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the twin uh, brother from the northern hemisphere of uh, Eduardo Bystrocki. Um, thank you, uh, Vincent, for your uh, uh, very uh, inspiring papers. Paper, I had uh, I'd like uh, two uh, questions, remark. Uh, the first one is that uh, uh, it's good to go back to the basics and the fact that a good tax is a tax that is accepted by the people. And that makes me think about the fact that we've been, uh, from a purely democratic institution and perspective, uh, put a lot of emphasis on, on procedures, uh, parliamentary approval and other aspects in order to enhance the legitimacy of a tax, but uh, we shouldn't forget that also the content and structure of the tax plays a role in its uh, democratic legitimacy, and that helps. It's a, a good uh, way, I think it's the first instrument <laughs> that uh, allow to, allows uh, us to, to, to discuss legitimacy of the tax from a a substantive uh, uh, viewpoint. The second point uh, uh, I wanted to make, I find it very interesting about the digital service tax. I'm myself, I'm quite uh, uh, favorable um, uh, for, for several reasons uh, um, um, on the introduction of, of such, such a tax. And I'm wondering, I don't know, of course, uh, re, re making the entire uh, exercise would be diff too difficult, but um, I'm thinking about uh, would, in your view, uh, the answer of the people would have been different if instead of saying we will create a new tax on digital services, that we will incre increase existing taxes, and I'm thinking of VAT, GST, only on digital services, because that, I think, from a let's say from a more procedural legal perspective at the EU level, that's the, the way to go, like to have a, a, a net ad, increased rate on on digital services within the VAT. Do you think that the pr perspective of the people, when instead of saying it will be a new tax, we will increase an existing tax, would it make a difference um, in the in the way you you in the in the answer? Or is it irrelevant as long as people understand that digital services will be taxed? Thanks, Eduardo. And I think Irma has a small intervention to make on this. So. Yeah, I, I think it will be very short, but it's exactly about Eduardo. And I was asking whether to Vincent, whether to challenge, if not only about looking at how much revenue the tax will give. So if it's a digital service tax of a VAT, of the pillar one, and then to see whether the reply will be different, because there is a paper on taxation and digitalization that was published in, a in Asia from the IMF, where they defend completely the VAT. So perhaps it's just a challenge, but you have kind of two minutes to reply. So. 
Right, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, large market jurisdictions, that's a, a totally fair point. Eduardo, uh, uh, we had to do this because in the design, it needed to be credible that there was a big multinational from that country. But I think expanding the scope makes total sense. The constraint there is, of course, if money. I'm a poor Canadian researcher and these surveys are very expensive. Um, the power of symbols, yes, uh, I'm on board with this. Uh, add to the tax burden. This is this is a very good point. I think that's and my my intuition is the same as yours. So I think people like it because it adds to the tax burden. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, but the the conclusion there remains the same in the sense that even if there's a deal now to roll back these DSTs, then there's always the fact that this symbolic argument resonates with the people. So there's a chance that they might come back. So I think both points uh, make total sense with our results. Uh, in terms of the other question, good tax is a tax that. I, I need a good uh, quote by like Thomas Jefferson or something about this. That's, a, that's great. Um, the new tax is existing versus the tax only. So uh, Irma and Eduardo, uh, the pillar one versus DST. Uh, so what I've learned from Andre, who's my colleague, who's the like foremost public opinion scholar in Canada, is that it, and when you do surveys like this, it's really hard to write questions that are simple enough. It's It's hard to overestimate how simple you need them to be. So, so my sense in general, in my intuition coming from this experience of working with him is probably that people would not see much difference between instruments like this. If it's about increasing the, the burden, the, the mechanism by which we do this probably does not matter that much for people. Maybe it does a bit, but maybe not, I, probably not. That would be my intuition, but, but of course I don't have any uh, evidence right now to support that, but uh, it, it will be an interesting study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. That's a wrap on this session. Over to you, Irma. Thank you so much. This is wonderful and perfect on time. We will take uh, 10 minutes uh, of a break and we will be at, in 10 minutes sharp because we will have two book lunches and we have people uh, that will also present or we help with the book lunch that is Marcos Neto, director from the UNDP, the finance sector of the UNDP, and at the same time, Marcio Verdi, executive secretary of the SIAT. So let's meet in 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Cooperation. 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. And for this purpose, we have two of the editors. I'm one of the editors together with Walter Leaves and Dri Lesage from the University of Ghent. And we will have first, uh, for 10 minutes, they will give their comments on the book, how, as editors, how they approach this book and what is the importance, of course, uh, right now. And thereafter, we will have some remarks from uh, Marcos Neto, director finance sector UNDP, uh, finance sector hub in the UNDP. Walter, I believe you are going to start first, so I give the word to you and you can share the screen. Yes, um, I don't have a, a presentation, so I will uh, just talk like, uh, like this. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm indeed Walter, um, currently a policy advisor at the Flemish Social uh, Democrats, but in a previous life, postdoc at uh, Ghent University and also one of the co-editors of this uh, book, Taxation, International Cooperation and the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, a book which I uh, am very happy to mention is open access at Springer. Um, so everyone who is interested, if you're not already one of the 18,000 people who has uh, downloaded this book, you are very welcome to do so um, if you are interested. Um, so this book actually started as a, uh, a workshop, a workshop in Bruges in 2019, uh, which some of the people uh, who I've seen over the course of, of this symposium uh, have also attended, uh, a workshop at, at the Unucris in, uh, in Bruges, in which we asked the question, how is taxation linked with uh, development policy and uh, the sustainable development uh, goals? And that was the, um, in that workshop, we brought together people from uh, various disciplines, uh, both academic and uh, in the practitioner's world. And uh, from that workshop, the idea grew for this, this book. This book in which we attempted to, to have a, uh, a holistic and interdisciplinary dialogue between many 
uh, perspectives uh, reflecting on the question of how is tax linked with the SDGs. And, and we've always said when we, when we did the book, we want this book to be interesting for both uh, for academics, um, for development practitioners and for tax practitioners, because those are three groups um, which don't always talk to each other as much as they need to. And so with this book, we wanted to have a, a sort of a, a dialogue um, in there. Um, this book has 10 chapters, 10 chapters with 20 authors, I believe, Irma, in total. Yeah. Um, on themes such as global governance, uh, external access, uh, assistance for taxation, um, attracting investment using tax incentives, and harmful and helpful tax practices for achieving uh, development. And so um, it's a, a, um, a very diverse and, and um, book with many insights. And so it's, it's, it's hard uh, uh, to find a, um, a common thread. And I know I tried because I'm the, uh, the author of the conclusions. I've had to make this exercise. But um, if you've read this book, Pack to Cover, I believe um, you will have learned uh, the importance of five uh, conditions, five conditions which are um, necessary in, in our view to achieve this link between taxation uh, in a sustainable way to finance and achieve the SDGs. Transparency, data, homegrown policies, eradicating double standards and inclusiveness. Those are the five um, common threads uh, between all the chapters in this book to which all the authors refer to in uh, in some kind of way, I'm very sorry. I have to. Marlies, can you open it? Yeah, sorry, my, my mother is here with my daughter. Um, where were I? Yes, first of all, data. Data, because data underpins policy. Um, it is a compass, um, uh, the compass on which policy is built, and um, access to, to data, quality of data, the framing, the sources of data, those are all political facts. And uh, um, I think we should uh, pay very close attention to. Next, transparency, because transparency increases trust, fairness, performance, access accountability of the tax system, both taxpayers and uh, government transparency. The importance of homegrown policy, because there's no cookie cutter approach to tax practices. You can't just transplant one practice from one place to another and expect it to work. Eradicating double standards, um, do as we say, not as we do, is not a basis for a good um, policy. Um, um, and practices in the West have spillovers in the South and have spillovers uh, uh, on the link on, between taxation and uh, sustainable development. And last uh, uh, and perhaps most important, inclusiveness, true participation on equal footing in, in international fora in bilateral relationship. Um, those are, uh, if you've read this book, you'll become convinced of that those are five conditions that are uh, fundamental to achieving the link between taxation and uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, and so with that, I think uh, I will leave the floor to Dries, who will uh, continue this uh, tale on the book. Thank you very much, Wouter. Thank you very much, uh, organizers, to give us the opportunity to, to present the book. Um, so it, it already in the title, we refer to the 2030 Agenda of the United Nations and the SDGs. And as we know, the SDGs currently are off track, badly off track. This was already the case before the pandemic. Now, with the pandemic, it, it gets even worse. And um, taxation, fair taxes, domestic resource mobilization is critical to the achievement of uh, the SDGs. That there is one target on domestic resource, resource mobilization, but it's clear that, uh, that revenues are uh, crucial uh, for the success of the entire uh, set of goals and targets of the SDGs. And in the book, uh, authors offer various avenues for, for improvement, for, for more impact. 
the, the, there is a there is a chapter on the on the place of uh, developing countries in discussions on standard setting with regard to transfer pricing, for example. There is a chapter on how rich countries, donor countries, can improve their policy coherence um, while designing their domestic uh, tax policies and looking into impacts for lower income countries. Uh, there, there's a chapter on, uh, on negative spillovers in, in the same context, for example. And looking at the topics in the book and also hearing uh, several of the interventions uh, during this conference, uh, I think um, we are facing a few fundamental problems and the, the two pillar structure of uh, the, the recent OECD G20 inclusive framework decision um, has also indicated these problems. On the one hand, what G20 OECD inclusive framework achieved is historic in several regards, but at the same time, it's a missed opportunity. Um, hearing the criticisms coming from <coughs> and mid-income countries coming from global civil society, which indicates that, that we are we are having still a very important and exciting agenda ahead, both with regard to substance. Um, we we see that the world is still stuck to old principles and and rules. For example, the at arm length principle and all the criticism uh, people have about that. Uh, we are also stuck to highly unequal uh, government governance uh, mechanisms. With all due respect to the efforts of uh, G20 OECD through the inclusive framework, but this uh, two pillar project was, I, I believe, a test case to 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 see whether this non UN. Uh, OECD-led architecture is sufficiently inclusive, passes the test with regard to input legitimacy, and I'm afraid um, that it did not really pass. Um, th that's apparently also the feeling of the G77, uh, the group of developing countries in the United Nations which tabled a draft resolution uh, a few weeks ago, uh, repeating uh, a previous demand for an upgrade of the UN Tax Committee, um, Committee of Experts towards a genuinely intergovernmental body that also takes on the, the interesting uh, political dis discussions. Um, so I think uh, to, 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 to keep the global tax agenda interesting enough, inclusive enough, uh, also, that it that it fits the the, the priorities and needs of uh, of the world's poor and then the low income countries, mid income countries. Um, there there is a, a diplomatic uh, battle ahead. Um, I will conclude. I, I'm I'm afraid the G20 OECD uh, will now say we made a decision. No, let's gonna talk about implementation. So that they will close ranks with regard to uh, new and, and, and fundamental fundamental discussions. Therefore, I'm I'm looking at uh, the UN General Assembly, the, the G77, the G24 of developing countries, which already made uh, interesting contributions. Also, regional tax organizations like uh, the African Tax Administration Forum, uh, which among the regional tax organization takes on tax policy political discussions is closely in touch with the African Union. There's already links to uh, to the book of uh, Annette uh, Ogutu, uh, which, which comes next. So uh, to conclude, uh, at the end of, 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 of this uh, conference day, I, 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 I would say let's look forward to, to very interesting discussions on substance and governance. And our book is a contribution to this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dries and Walter. And let me now introduce uh, Marco Satia Neto, who joined the UNDP in February 2013. And since April 2019, uh, he is leading the establishment and management of the UNDP new finance sector. So he has been working on issues of sustainable development, poverty eradication, and multi, -stake partner, uh, multi stakeholder partnership building. So please go ahead, Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irma. Um... Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are is the new way to greet people on, 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 on Zoom. Uh, 
you know, and, and I'm coming from a very cold New York City today. Um, it's a privilege to address the third Global Tax Symposium today. Thank you very much for affording me the opportunity to release the book, Taxation, International Cooperation, and the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. And I want to start by congratulating Professors Irma Mosquera, Dries Lesage, with the leaps in all the authors who collaborate in writing this book. My heartfelt congratulations to all of you on this great piece of work, as has been said, at the right time. We really need uh, a, a different way of looking on taxations vis-a-vis -vis the SDGs and, 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 and the role of taxation in getting governments to, to advance their own national policies around the SDGs and perhaps the Paris Agreement the, the, you know, reflected in the um, NDCs as well. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals are a universal call of action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure people around the world enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Advancing Agenda 2030 is, however, challenging and requires significant, well-targeted public and private investment. Enhanced domestic resource mobilization propelled by improved tax systems, together with international cooperation on taxation issues, are key to financing the required investments. Weak tax collection, both in terms of quantity and quality, sever severely hampers efforts by developing countries to achieve the national development agendas and the SDGs. The COVID-19 crisis we are still living has further exacerbated the financing gap and aggravated the social and economic situation globally. According to our colleagues at UNCTAD, uh, in the Economic Development Africa report in 2020, um, Africa could gain 89 billion annually by curbing illicit financial flows. If the same amount had been invested in the procurement of vaccines, it would have been enough to fully inoculate people with over 11 billion doses. At UNDP, we are working through the Tax for Sustainable Development Goals Initiative to support developing countries' augmented domestic resource mobilization as well as leverage tax policies to promote new and more sustainable growth strategies. We have a joint program with the OECD called the Tax Inspectors Without Borders, working with partners, including ATAF. Um, we have been able to help developing countries raise $1.4 billion in additional tax ever revenues through TIWB. We need to further expand people's choices for fairer, sustainable future. To build the world envisaged by the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with Planet and People in Balance. This book is thus very timely. It explores key thematic areas in some of the most prominent issues of taxations we are currently witnessing in countries' national agenda. Some of these ideas will help us design the future work and provide practical support for countries. While the tolerance for tax evasions is diminishing, and taxes front page news through the OECD deal and the G20. Um, however, the achieving of the SDGs, we need to we, we need to strengthen multilateralism and we need to go beyond, I agree, the current agreement that has been reached. Thus, the significance of international cooperation on taxation matters is essential, and the book explored these topics in depth. We hope that this important contribution to the international tax dialogue will prompt a deeper consideration of the issues and challenges faced by developing countries, and that these insights will help us design better interventions to support countries in the tax measures needed to achieve, achieve 2030 agenda. From as a UNDP, I look forward to a continuous collaboration with you as professors that have read in this book as we move forward to helping developing countries think taxation and SDGs, we will be counting back on you to help us think what are the best ways to secure those advisors and get those go governments to move forward. Thank you very much and congratulations again. Thank you so much, Marcos. Uh, you were perfect on time. Uh, I will still see whether we have time later on to try to uh, see how can I put the video uh, from a from a uh, from the other part from Asusa uh, from the Bhutan Bhutan uh, UNDP representative. So I will work on that. But in the meantime, we give the word to the second book.
And the second book is about BEPS and the blueprint on BEPS uh, for Africa response. So thank you so much. You have already the link to the book on tax and development. Um, and then after the book of tax and development, we are discussing now the books for, on BEPS. Um, so we will start first with Anne de Guto. Thank you so much, Marcos, once again, Walter, Andres, and we will start now with Anne Oguto. You will have some time to introduce your book, and then after we will give it to, the word to Marcio. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I am so grateful to the Global Tax Symposium for providing this platform uh, to launch my book. And thank you also for Omasio, who has reviewed the book, and I'm looking forward to your remarks. The book is here for those of you that haven't seen it, entitled Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, a Blueprint for Africa's Response. I enjoyed drafting the book. Well, the inspiration for this book was hatched at the IBFD's second Africa Tax Symposium, which took place in Uganda in 2016 when I and uh, Ms. Uh, Bilema Obforubo, the chair of uh, the IBFD Center for Studies in African Taxation, pondered the death of books on international tax in Africa and publications on issues like base erosion and profit shifting from an African perspective. The book notes that the increasing globalization and technological enhancements have led to the integration of global economies. This has created opportunities for multinationals to invest globally. Since taxes and expense, like any other, multinationals will obviously engage in base erosion and profit shifting practices to lower their global tax exposure. And this impacts on countries' domestic revenue mobilization, which inevitably impacts on economic growth. While BEPS practices occur in all countries, they are damaging everywhere, the social and economic impact on developing countries such as those in Africa is more severe. Given their smaller markets, heavier reliance on corporate in, uh, income taxes, and even their weak uh, enforcement capabilities. The OECD issued its 15 action measures to uh, uh, address BEPS, and it's now more than five years since the OECD issued those reports. After five years, it is necessary to consider how countries have fared. My research in this book showed that whereas many developed countries and emerging economies have taken big steps in implementing BEPS measures, the OECDPR review reports on the implementation of the BEPS minimum standards shows that the uptake has not been great in many developing countries, especially those in Africa. This book acknowledges that even though BEPS is a global concern, the nature of BEPS concerns is not uniform for all countries. Certain BEPS schemes that work to undermine the European or American tax base often do not coincide with the African paradigm. The book admits that despite the fact that African countries were not involved in setting the agenda for BEPS measures, with the increased foreign direct investment in Africa, and the fact that Africa has historically lagged behind developed countries in enacting international tax laws, it is in Africa's interest to implement BEPS measures. The book discusses the BEPS concerns that are of priority to African countries, but it goes beyond the concerns identified by the OECD BEPS project and analyzes other factors that contribute to BEPS in Africa, such as issues relating to tax incentives and related illicit financial flow issues, which are of particular concerns to Africa. With reference to court cases on various BEP issues that have been decided in various African countries and tax administration and ministry of finance reports, as well as other publications, the book finds that BEPS is rife in Africa as exemplified from BEPS experiences of various countries ranging from English speaking, French speaking and Portuguese speaking African countries. The book finds that some African countries have taken steps to address BEPS over the last five years. However, the overwhelming trend across Africa is that there are policy 
legislative, administrative, economic, and social political challenges that have hindered Africa's ability to curtail BIPs. To address these challenges, the book provides legislative, administrative, and policy measures that are fit for purpose for Africa's context and specific circumstances in addressing BIPs. Therefore, beyond the 15 action measures the OECD recommends, the book explores other practical measures and tailored approaches, which may be more suitable for capacity constrained African countries in addressing their particular BEPS concerns without undermining the integrity of the international tax system. In this regard, the book analyzes the UN's recommendations, the toolkits issued by the Platform for Collaboration for Tax, capacity development initiatives by organizations such as the Tax Inspectors Without Borders, as well as technical reports and suggested approaches of enacting certain BEPS legislation that have been issued by the likes of the African Tax Administration Forum, which has played a big role at the OECD inclusive framework in proactively presenting a united African position on various BEPS issues. The book enjoins African countries to make use of the current international focus on issues relating to BEPS, to develop their international tax laws while the international political will and support of the international community still stands. The overarching theme in the book, are, themes in the book are discussed in five parts. Part one provides the background and context regarding domestic resource mobilization in Africa. It provides the general discussion of BEPS from an African perspective and gives cases and gives the case for implementing BEPS measures in Africa and provides the policy perspective that African countries should consider before adopting certain BEPS measures. Part two discusses BEPS minimum standards from an African perspective. Part three discusses BEPS best practices from an African perspective. Part four discusses the BEPS international standards such as the OECD transfer pricing guidelines and the challenges that African countries face when adopting such standards uh, um, in their context. Part five discusses measures that we are presented as analytical reports, such as the Matlato instrument and its uptake in Africa, and also issues relating to the taxation of the digital economy from an African perspective. The book is written for those with an interest in tax policy in Africa. For the tax administration official, it is a helpful guide to the solid principles undergirding BEPS issues. For the tax practitioner, it is a comprehensive text on international tax law in Africa. For the legal draftsman, it provides inspiration for innovation and effective rule making. For the tax researchers, the book is a great resource. I am grateful for the idea BFD Center for Studies in African Taxation and its dedication to the study and development of taxation in Africa. As a result of which, I was granted the IBFD 2020 CSAT Fellowship to conduct the final research that led to the publication of this book. I trust that the book contributes to the body of knowledge of international tax from an African perspective that has been missing on the international scene. Thank you once again for the platform to launch this book. Thank you so much, Annette. Um, then I will now give the word to uh, Marcio Verdi, and he's an economist and retired tax auditor of the Federal Revenue Service of Brazil. And uh, Mr. Verdi is now the executive secretary of the Inter-American Center of Tax Administrations and currently the chair of the Network of Tax Organizations. And since he also, uh, the SIAT also contributed one chapter on the book of BEPS to the previous book on tax and development, I thought he would be the nice uh, and appropriate person to say what is his experience in BEPS from the SIAT perspective and how he sees also these developments and also regarding uh, the book and of course BEPS in general. Thank you so much, Marcia, for being here and I give the word to you. Thank you, dear Irma, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Actually, I'm very happy to participate in this very interesting discussion, very interesting for me morning. As, 
I'd like to first to congratulate and and to to all that have participated in the in the edition, the preparation of this very important book, because uh, this book, in my opinion, it, it, it marks a position uh, uh, that should be analyzed and evaluated by all decision makers. Uh, we are always talking, there are many participants from the academy. I'm not from the academy, I'm from the public sector. I have more than 40 years working for the public sector. And I think uh, for me it's important to state that I, I really uh, support that the, the academia should participate in all discussions of tax policy, not only the international one, but uh, the internal one to the countries. Uh, because we are always talking about equal footing, for example. The inclusive framework is an equal footing place. But what is equal footing? Equal footing is to have one vote, each one. No, this is not equal footing. For me, what is important is to have the equal footing in terms of knowledge, of understanding, the capacity to analyze, to evaluate, and to understand what we are discussing and implementing. And be sure that for a commissioner, for a tax director, a tax administrator nowadays, uh, understand all such issues that we are discussing in the international arena is very complicated. We should understand what is block change, what is pillar one, pillar two, action one, action 15, action 12, and uh, but we our reality is much more complicated than the reality of the developed countries no we have uh, we see in the other panels we have and we all know this we have a uh, such uh, levels of uh, informality our when you look for beps what is beps based erosion but the program BEPS that I applaud is a great program, very important one. I applaud the OECD for the BEPS program. But when you are in a developing country, your base erosion is much more complex. You have a base erosion that is not part of the BEPS program related to VAT, related of the income tax, but internal income tax, internal income tax. So the, the book for me, it came in the right moment is a great book uh, because the books present a, 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 a vision from developing countries. And this is important because, and I'm very proud to say when we, we are part of the BEP since the year 2013, as I said, I applaud the BEPS initiative. Why I'm saying this? Because first, for me, BEPS is not an event. Of course, it's not an event. We start this in 2013. Uh, quite uh, after quite 10 years, we are just trying to implement. We have many countries they they didn't implement yet the many measures, uh, even included in the minimum standard. But BEPS is a process, and but for me is an opportunity and a challenge. Why why is an opportunity? Because we know that. Without a global movement, the process of modernization, of adaptation of the legal framework of our countries would be very slow and difficult. It's very complicated for a tax administration to uh, discuss with the society and justify why they need to improve and approve new legislations and explain and first to understand the 15 actions and just to justify why you need to include an action that uh, talk about mandatory disclose. So, so for me, it's an opportunity, BEPS, because the global nature of the program push our societies to seek the necessary regulatory rev uh, revision. And we need this. Without BEPS, I think it would be very difficult. It's an opportunity too, because we recognize uh, that without the collaboration between the tax administrations, without the peers, it would be quite impossible to strengthen the tax administration and to, to, to achieve 
the tools that we need to fight against international tax evasion. But it's a challenge because we know that our difficulties in, in terms of resource, in, in human resource, in the use of IT, uh, in the budgetary resource. So you need to define, to implement new systems. But if you don't have a guarantee that you have a budgetary for the next three years, how could you uh, implement new IT systems? So this critical view is very important. And of course, I, we don't have time and I would love to discuss action by action, but let's just think about the one of, of, or two about the, the 15 actions. And special for you, uh, if you look for the action three, of course, we all applaud the action three, the control for each companies. It's a very important action. But if it's a very important action for a country, if the country has multinational companies, if you don't have a company in your country with subsidiaries in other countries, this action three, there is no value for you. You don't have multinational companies. The action 12, for example, for me, is a very modern action, a very interesting one. Again, I applaud this initiative, but if you, uh, the questions, are you ready? Are you ready to approve a legislation that will uh, include the mandatory disclose of tax planning for the companies? If you do this, you should be ready to answers, to evaluate the mandatory disclose presented by the companies and give the companies the guarantee that they need. So if you don't have the conditions to give the answer to the companies, how could you implement the action 12? So there are other actions that of course, uh, uh, they are easier, and we all need like action eight, nine, 10, related to transfer pricing, action 13, country by country report. So just to conclude, I think we, what we have done, not seen, done together in terms of international taxation is fantastic. I'm a retired tax auditor. When I see what we have achieved with the global forum, the level of exchange of information. Uh, we eliminate the bank secrecy in the world for fiscal uh, purpose. And uh, now the, the, the final beneficiary, you know, the, so what we have achieved is fantastic. And the BEPS project is very, very important one. But BEPS is a process. It's gonna take many years and maybe in 10 or 20 years, a few actions for many countries, they, the priority, what I'm trying to say, if you identify the priorities, what is a priority for one country, maybe for Africa country, for the neighbor country is not a priority, like what I said about the action three. If you don't have multinational companies, Action three is not a priority for you. But what I would like to conclude is this book is a very important book, should be used a lot, should be maybe transformed in a digital e-learning training course, because we need this, because the only way that we will achieve what we call equal footing is by the knowledge. And this is a long process. Congratulations again to all. Uh, we, we wrote one chapter. So I'm very happy to have, to have this opportunity this morning. Thank you very much, Irma. Thank you so much, uh, Marcel. Thank you so much, Annette, for this uh, introduction. I think that these two books reflect really sometimes the questions that we have regarding what it means with BEPS, what does it mean for developing countries, but also in general with the sustainable development agenda. So um, uh, both books, uh, you have it on the, in the program, you have the link to the book, so you can also have it. Um, unfortunately, I'm running out of time, and I know I have already all the 
uh, panelists for the last panel. Uh, so the video from Azusa Kubota, who is the resident representative of UNDP in Bhutan, will be also uploaded in the in our YouTube Globe Tax Corp. And we are trying now to give you also the link. Uh, so you will have it also uh, there. Um, Eduardo, I will just put the program and then I will give the word to you. And thank you so much, everyone. And welcome to the final uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irma. And uh, once again, welcome to our closing panel of the third Global Tax Symposium. Needless to say, I mean, we, we are in a constitutional moment for, for international taxation, in international taxation. So we, we thought that it would be very good to ask a, a difficult question for an impressive uh, panel members that are, have accepted to participate uh, today. So the, the, the difficult question is, are we heading towards an international tax regime fit for the 21st century? Of course, I am assuming that the, I mean, pillar one and pillar two will be two fundamental elements of the new international tax regime. And in order to offer their views, we have decided to, to invite key um, players of international taxation. So we, we invited um, two leading organizations uh, in international tax, I mean, the OECD and the UN, three, large market jurisdictions, the US, China, and India, a, a prominent global tax hub, the Netherlands, and, and finally, uh, the view from the developing world using Africa uh, as a case study. So we will organize uh, this panel as, as follows. I will be presenting um, each panel members at a time. They will have 10 minutes each, 10 minutes each, and then we will have uh, 10, between 10 and 15 minutes for questions uh, from the floor. So based on, on, on this uh, plan, I am delighted to, to invite David Bradbury, who works at the Organization for Economic Policy and Development. He's head of the Tax Policy and Statistics Divisions at, at the OECD. So David, a very warm welcome. And we are looking forward to, to knowing your response to, to our fundamental question this evening. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to join you. And I'm joining you from my office in Paris. Uh, obviously, we look forward to the moment when we can all reconvene and, and meet each other in person. Hopefully, that's not too far away. But this really is the, the, the multi-billion dollar question. Uh, are we heading towards an international tax system uh, that is fit for the the modern economy. And I think that it's important to recognize that um, to the extent that there is any such thing as an international tax system, it's, uh, it's constantly evolving over time. And I think we should recognize that, but notwithstanding the, the fact that it is constantly evolving, I think we should also recognize that the, the recent agreement at the international level with 137 jurisdictions agreeing to the two pillar solution to address the tax challenges arising from digitalization, we really have a significant leap forward in, in terms of that ongoing evolution. And I'd like to reflect upon a, a few aspects of the agreement and to put them into context to, to give a sense of, of why I think uh, that has been a significant leap forward. Now, I'd like to talk a little about the two pillars, but beginning with, with, with pillar one, I want to reflect upon a couple of features of what has been agreed on Pillar 1. The first thing I want to observe is that through Pillar 1, we are actually looking at a multinational group as a collective group, really for the first time in the way in which we've approached uh, international tax matters. So I think that in itself is a really significant step forward and an important one. Another thing that we do under Pillar 1 is that we we recognize the existence of taxing rights in the absence of physical presence. Now, this is a, a hugely significant step forward and one that I think really recognizes that the existing international tax rules, uh, they really have been anchored in uh, a set of, uh, of, of rules 
that were developed the best part of 100 years ago at a time when it really was essential for a company to have a physical presence in a jurisdiction in order to have a significant economic presence. Uh, of course, today we know that you can have a, a significant commercial presence in a jurisdiction without any physical presence. And that can be because of uh, the fact that uh, digitalization has allowed you to penetrate a market from afar, or it could just be more broadly uh, as a result of uh, some of the forces of globalization that we've seen and experienced over many decades, but have been intensified in recent times. That's the second point. Uh, I think there are a couple of other important features of Pillar One that are worth remarking upon. And one is that we are really allocating taxing rights over corporate profits, uh, a part of those profits, uh, for the first time by allocating that taxing right to a market jurisdiction, the, the, the location of the customer or the location of uh, the user in the case of highly digitalized firms. And once again, that's a significant change to the way in which the, the corporate tax rules have operated in the past. Uh, and um, in doing all of this, uh, we have allocated part of those taxing rights by reference to a formula. Now, I mentioned those four separate elements because to some extent, if you had said to, to me uh, just a couple of years ago that we would be at a point in time where 137 jurisdictions around the world would agree to introduce changes along the lines of those four dimensions, I would have thought that you were, uh, well, to be polite, I would have said you were being very ambitious. Uh, I, I would have perhaps thought that you were stark raving mad if you had even contemplated that that might be a possibility. And here we are today where uh, agreement has been reached on those principles. Now, of course, um, that applies um, almost as an overlay to the existing system as uh, it has existed and, and, and complements and, and supplements that system. If we look at pillar two, and um, pillar two really, I think is the, the, the most recent um, evolution of the international discussion on uh, BEPS and base erosion and profit shifting more broadly. Now, I, I, I joined um, the, the end of the, the previous session and, uh, and, and, and saw uh, some of the, the passionate contributions uh, in relation to BEPS. And BEPS has been, I think, a significant pro process at a multilateral level uh, where significant achievements have been secured. Uh, but I think it was also recognised as part of the ongoing negotiations uh, at the inclusive framework that for, for all of the success stories of BEPS, there were still issues that remained unresolved. And some of them are those issues that I've just referred to in terms of the, the uh, tax challenges arising from digitalization. But I think it's also recognized that um, while ever you continue to have arrangements in place that can allow corporations to reduce their effective tax rates to you know, extremely low levels, and potentially in some cases, and I, I, just as an aside, I make this point, that quite often when people talk about pillar two and the 15% effective tax rate as being the floor on tax competition, there's almost an assumption that the system as it currently exists, that the floor is zero. That's actually not true because um, governments actually could um, provide tax subsidies or subsidies through their tax system in order to attract investment under the current system. Uh, so at the moment, there is effectively no flaw to tax competition. Pillar two does not eliminate uh, the ability of sovereign nations to compete using tax as one of a number of instruments that they might wish to deploy. But it does put in place a multilaterally agreed limit. And that limit is at an effective tax rate of 15%. And um, you know, I hear a lot of people in discussion say that's not low enough. Oh, that's sorry, that's not high enough. It's too low. Um, but it's an effective rate. And I think it's really important to not lose sight of that, that, you know, people often focus on statutory rates, but even in those countries with the highest of statutory rates, there are still, uh, there are still multinationals that are generating uh, uh, substantial profits that are subject to effective tax rates below that minimum. 
Uh, and once again, just a few years ago, if you had suggested that there would be some degree of global agreement on a minimum effective tax rate at 15%, I would have thought that that was extremely ambitious. And here we are today. Uh, so of course, uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, that the system uh, that, is, uh, that these changes that have been agreed are going to be perfect. Um, they are like any other compromise agreement where you get 137 people, uh, uh, countries together to agree. Uh, I say to people, I have a family of six at home and uh, if we can all agree on somewhere to have, uh, have a, a meal out for dinner, uh, we're doing well. So to reach agreement amongst the 137 jurisdictions is a significant, a significant matter. Um, one final point that I'd like to make, and, and I think in some respects for me, this is, uh, uh, if not as important, potentially more important than uh, all of those other things that I've referred to. And that is that I think that the inclusive framework on BEPS um, as a forum for international discussion and negotiation around these issues uh, has emerged as, as, as a crucial piece of the, the, the international architecture. Uh, now, you might expect me to say that because I'm from the OECD and we obviously were, were, were very uh, intimately involved in working with uh, the, the G20 and other countries to set up the inclusive framework. But I do honestly believe that the inclusive framework has given countries from all around the globe an opportunity to contribute to this discussion on an equal footing. And I think that the, the agreement that has been reached reflects a whole range of of, of areas where um, countries that were not even a part of the BEPS project just a few years ago have been able to influence the final outcomes. And, and I see it, it may not always be obvious to those that have not been involved in the day-to-day -day negotiations, but I can see elements of the agreement that have the fingerprints of different countries on them. And you know, to some extent, I think that is going to be an important lasting legacy of, of uh, of where we're at. Uh, so it's not just about the system that we have today, it's about uh, the ability to be able to, uh, to ensure that that continues to be fit for purpose in, in the future. But I think I've spoken for, for 10 minutes, so I'll leave my, my remarks there. Eduardo, you are mute. Hey, David, thank you so much for, for your response to this very challenging um, question. And now I am very happy to, to invite Marlene Parker. She's a member of the UN Committee of Experts on International Cooperation in Tax Matters. She's um, based in Jamaica. So uh, could you please, Marlene, offer your response to, to this question? Thank you very much, Eduardo, and thanks, um, Irma, uh, for inviting me to participate. I just all, also want to greet everyone well and all the best for the season. Congratulate Annette on the launch of her book, which I think will have resonance beyond the shores of Africa because we share common concerns. Um, and to Mar 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 Marcio for his um, intervention as well. So in looking at, at this issue, um, my reflections will cover uh, what uh, you know, we have traditionally thought to be the features of a good or fit tax system. And for the purposes of my intervention, I, I'm gonna use the terms interchangeably. I'm also gonna share Jamaica's perspective on the global tax um, economy as it now uh, stands um, and on the BEPS initiative and um, what I see as some threats that could undermine uh, um, the achievement of a fit tax system for the 20th, um, 21st century. So this discussion comes against the background of a global pandemic now entering its third year, resulting in a worldwide health and economic crisis, as well as the forging of what has been de described as a historic global tax deal. And so while this deal focuses primarily on digitalization of the economy and the mitigation of BEPS, it also highlighted the need for wider issues to be examined in the global tax landscape. The specific point of convergence between taxation and the pandemic is that countries, particularly developing countries, will need to rely on mobilization of domestic resources to rebuild shattered economies, and for most countries, a robust tax system will be at the heart of that recovery. 
Reliance will also be placed on multilateral solutions to deal with these tax issues as countries strive to protect their tax base from further erosion. Governments will need to revenue to confront not just economic recovery, but sustainable development and the ravages of climate change. And so any global tax system will have to confront those headwinds. So the issues that we are now discussing uh, define the moment we are in. We find our, um, ourselves in a situation where um, the, whether or not the tax system will live up to, to, to confronting those issues is now paramount. Now, traditionally, we are told that a good tax system uh, has certain principles attached. Uh, we all know about fairness, equity, economic efficiency, certainty, simplicity, administrative ease and transparency, policy coherence. And those have traditionally defined um, what a good tax system is. This is what we measure to determine whether or not there is good tax governance and the system is functioning as it should. And some of those same principles have filtered into the global tax system, which purport to have its roots in the principles of fairness, equity, transparency, tax policy coherence, and are enshrined in domestic law as well as double taxation and multilateral agreements. The main features of the global tax system, the source principle, residence principle, permanent establishment, methods of avoiding double taxation, transfer pricing, anti-avoidance, and so on. And of course, the cross-border cooperation, which um, uh, in which um, administrative tax authorities are engaged. These are all features of the global tax system. However, while the world has generally agreed on these principles, there were always cracks which have undermined those very principles of fairness, transparency, simplicity, and it is argued even legitimacy. The main perpetrators in bringing about these cracks are government themselves and the exploitative behavior of MNEs facilitated by government policy. The fact that there is inequity surrounding source and residence spread rules, um, sorry about that, um, source and, and uh, residence um, rules, particularly in double tax agreements between developing and developed countries, that continues to be um, uh, an issue. And um, also impactful is the fact that the global tax system operates in a wider global economic and financial framework, which is fraught with its own inequities and complicates the issue if, um, even more. In the interest of time, I will just uh, share um, on the focus that the global tax system has placed on MNEs. Both developed and developing countries continue to be plagued by the exploitation of MNEs of the international tax system. And this has been driven not only by aggressive tax planning, but also, as I said, by government policy as governments seek to stimulate economic growth by tax competition. This has accelerated the race to the bottom and it crosses across developed as well as developing country. The result of course being base erosion and profit shifting. And so what has been the response of the global global tax community. Uh, well, the OECD, which is at the epicenter of the standard setting, um, introduced uh, maybe about 11 years ago, the Global Forum, 157 countries have, have joined the Global Forum. And so transparency and accountability have played an important role in trying to bring about a balance in the global tax system. The Global Forum is a worthy initiative but there are some issues that could be addressed in order to make it uh, more fit or more proper. And that has to do with the time and deployment of uh, staff and, and as well as um, financial resources to meet um, some of the automatic exchange of information requirements. Also, um, the fact that when staff get the information, they are not quite sure how to use it. So there's a capacity building component that accompanies the automatic exchange of information framework. It is also fair to say that, um, there, that the impact on transparency where the Global Forum is concerned um, is measured in revenue enhancement. And it is in fact um, 
given the um, information and statistics that we get out of the um, OECD and others, there has been revenue impact coming out of um, the Global Forum. However, we do need to look at whether or not the fact that the Panama Papers and the Pandora Papers uh, have emerged since the Global Forum was formed. I think we in the global community need to look at whether or not um, the, the Global Forum uh, regime can be made more effective. I now come to BEPS, and um, I won't go too much into the fact that it was 44 countries who developed the BEPS initiative, and, and, and um, some of what developing countries would have uh, wanted to have seen as minimum standards, like perhaps Action 4 and on uh, limitation of deductions, Action 7, which dealt with PE, perhaps if they had been at the um, table, those would have been um, focused on. But it is also important to remember that the BEPS, um, the inclusive framework, which came about uh, almost five years after, uh, no, 2013, 2016, three years after that, that inclusive framework, um, it is spelled, came about because there was a need, not so much for the involvement of developing countries, but because there was a need for legitimacy of some of the actions um, that the BEPS uh, initiative had to un undergo in order to bring about implementation. Now, some of um, our observations from Jamaica's standpoint on the um, BEPS um, framework, I don't know how I'm doing for time, uh, but um, I'm, I'm going to go very quickly through this. Uh, so um, in the recent discussions on di digitalization of the economy has highlighted the growing divide between source jurisdictions and resident jurisdictions on the issue of allocation of taxing rights. So that is a debate that we need to continue. And although digitalization tried to address what is referred to as market economies, that has not dealt with the overarching issue of the inequities between source and residence countries. It is also felt that in terms of the solutions that were arrived at, and I listened um, to David, and um, that amount A, will, it is felt, uh, will benefit more uh, of the developed countries, and amount B, it is felt, will benefit more of the developed countries, and, um, and even where the STTR is said to um, should be of some benefit to developing countries. That only operates where you have a treaty and there is a um, low or no um, uh, jurisdic low tax jurisdiction. And so if you have a small treaty network, then it needs to be assessed whether or not that will be helpful. So again, we are talking about what is fit and what is, is proper in terms of the whole global tax um, framework. The, so the allocation of taxing rights is one of the issues as we move forward in the 21st century that has to be addressed. The assistance provided to developing countries in determining their needs in the inclusive framework, the whole governance of the inclusive framework. And I pause here to highlight. Two minutes, please. Two minutes, okay. Yes. I pause here to highlight the report of the um, OECD to the um, to the to the G20, which has is trying to address some of those governance issues in the inclusive framework, the complexity of um, the measures, the time, and and we also recommend that the TIWB expand beyond um, what it is currently um, set up to do. So I'll just move on very quickly to what I see are some threats. I think government policy to compete um, economic activity. I think that um, the FHTP has tried to deal with that issue, but government policy, if, if, if there is no um, um, agreement, if gov governments continue to act only in their own interest and, in, and unilaterally, that will certainly throw off any um, system that is, um, will be accommodative of the 21st century um, what needs to be a good global tax system. The source and residence principle needs to be addressed, needs to be revisited. We don't even know whether or not those are fit anymore when you have shareholders and, and multiple connected parties all over the world. So that needs to be um, addressed. Inclusiveness as a principle also needs to be defined because having a seat at the table is not the same as having a, um, an influential voice at the table. So inclusiveness, political involvement from other countries outside of the G20, 
and, um, and the institutional framework who set the standards, whether or not um, the platform for collaboration should have a greater say in terms of um, the setting of standards, since there is greater representation there of countries that are not themselves involved in the inclusive framework. I think if those are not addressed, then what we may find is that we um, may not have a fit and proper global tax system. And that is what I think that we need um, to, to address the issues confronting us in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much for your response, Marilene. So we already have the response from the OECD, from the UN. Uh, now I, I will be inviting um, Dan Breman to offer his views uh, from the, the Dutch perspective. Uh, Dan Breman is International Taxation Acting Head of Unit, Ministry of Finance in the Netherlands. And then we will have five minutes for questions from the floor. So Dan, welcome to the third Global Tax Symposium and the floor is yours. Well, thank you uh, very much, Eduardo. And uh, thank you, Irma and Eduardo, for uh, inviting me to, uh, to be on this panel today and to share, uh, to share my views and uh, well, before I start, I, I think I have to say that uh, uh, the views I express here today are my own, not necessar necessarily the views of the Dutch uh, government, but uh, that's just as a, uh, as a side note. Um, now, let me move on to, uh, to, to, to today's question. Are we heading towards a tech system fit for the 21st century? And uh, Edouard you rightfully said, it's, 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 it's a big question to ask, uh, a very difficult question to answer. Uh, it begs for a yes or no answer, but I'm not sure I'll be able to uh, to give one uh, right away. And um, well, as a general remark, perhaps I'm, I'm stating the obvious. Uh, when I say that being in 2021, we're still fairly early in the 21st century, uh, there's still om almost 80 years to go. And um, we don't know what the world will, uh, will bring us, how things will develop. Um, and, and to put this into perspective, uh, say 30 years ago, uh, well, I certainly couldn't have imagined uh, what kind of an impact digitalization for the globalization would have to the world and, and, and to the tech system. Um, so, so already from that perspective, I think it's, it's a very difficult question. But of course, we can, can look at the two pillars we're working on right now. We can look at the challenges uh, we're facing currently. Um, and I think, uh, well, from a Dutch perspective, what we, get from society is that even after BEPS, um, there are still challenges. Firstly, um, there's the digitalization that I already mentioned. Um, the question whether uh, with all kinds of companies being able through digitalization or otherwise to, to, to be active in a jurisdiction without necessarily having a taxable presence in, in, in uh, well, within the framework of, of the current tax system, um, um, that's a challenge and, and, and society asks us to, to, to address that, uh, to address the question whether it's fair that, that, that large corporations may be active in, in, in the Netherlands in our case, but, but in other countries as well, without having a presence uh, here and, and, and paying tax here. Um, the other uh, question that we often got from society as well, uh, was BEP sufficient to, to stop tax avoidance? and, and uh, specifically in the case of the Netherlands, I will get back to that uh, in a minute. Um, the question also was, what, what is our role in, in, in tax avoidance and, 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 and the Dutch tax system in, in general? So, so to start with, with, with the first question um, addressed by Peter One of the, the, the OECD, I think David just, just very eloquently uh, laid out all the changes that, that Peter One will make to this tech system and that I believe will make it a better fit for the 21st century. Um, so, so I will not repeat all those. Um, I, I think I'll just say that, that I, uh, well, agree to, to, to what David said about the, those changes that we're making and, and what an achievement it is that, that we have, um, well, we've been able to, to agree to such fundamental changes uh, with the inclusive framework. Then on the second, uh, Peter, as I just said, um, 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 there, there was a call from society to, to, to also look at, well, um, uh, has BEPS been sufficient uh, to, to tackle tax avoidance? Uh, 
is there anything else that that we should do and also um how about a a, a race to the bottom and uh, it's been a very active debate in, in in the netherlands as well um also looking at, at the position of the netherlands and the netherlands has taken uh unilateral measures in in, in the last couple of years um uh, in addition to 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 the implementation of the BEPS package to ensure that the Netherlands is less susceptible to 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 being used by uh, large multinationals to 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 avoid taxes, um, but what we've also seen by doing that unilaterally, you know, especially since we're a small country, uh, we are not able to 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 do everything ourselves. And, and if we do something that that may uh, make a structure impossible with the Netherlands, there there may be other structures with uh, other countries involved that that would still be possible. So. Um, I'm not sure maybe it has come to a surprise to, 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 to some of uh, the people looking at the Dutch position, but we've been a uh, supporter of, of the Pillar 2 initiative from, from the outset. Um, and I do believe that uh, agreeing on a, a mechanism to ensure an effective tax rate worldwide on a worldwide basis, or well, on, uh, a worldwide agreement, but on a country by country basis, of course, um, I, I do think it's 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 used huge in, in improvements, and and um, I personally like the fact that that where BEPS was was really about artificiality, which made a lot of sense at that time of structures. Um, we're now looking at an effective tax rate because um, artificiality can can sometimes be very subjective, and and tax administrations would have to 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 look at what's artificial and and, and what not, whereas uh, or potentially. Um, if, 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 if we agree on, 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 uh, uh, on a set of rules to, to clearly define the basis for the effective tax rate, the way to calculate it, and, and, and we all implement it in the same way, uh, it's an effective if manner to, to, to well, ensure that always a certain level of tax is paid and that um, well, tax avoidance schemes are, uh, uh, are, are countered on a, a, a worldwide basis. So, I think that both both pillar one and pillar two, um, to get back to your question, definitely do help um, to make the system more fit for the 21st century, at least uh, to address the challenges that we have identified that society has asked us to, uh, to tackle um, and are an, uh, an improvement in, uh, in that sense. And uh, of course, I, I recognize that there may be complexity um, uh, the world keeps evolving, uh, taxation and, and, and ideas around fairness keep evolving. So maybe there, there, there will be another, uh, other costs on us to, 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 uh, to do further work um, 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 or, or maybe, well, uh, yeah. Um, and, and in that sense, I, I think it's also, um, and, and that's the comment I, I'd like to end with, I think it's uh, very, uh, a very good news for, for international cooperation, cooperation and international uh, cooperation in, in tax matters specifically. That despite the differences between countries, with with well, your introduction, find that the, the Netherlands being a, a fairly small Western country, uh, often referred to as an investment hub, uh, developing countries, uh, larger developed countries, and market economies that we've all managed to come together to, to have a constructive discussion uh, and to compromise just in order to, 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 to be able to agree on a, um, on a, a, a consensus-based worldwide solution instead of, of trying to do everything unilaterally, address concerns unilaterally, and, and, and perhaps get, get an even more complex uh, tech system. So, so, so even when there are additional uh, asks from society, to further improve the tech system to fit uh, within the 21st century. I think uh, it's, it's very hopeful that we've been able to agree this, and I'm confident that, that um, well, we will continue to be able to uh, cooperate internationally and uh, address any further concerns as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan, for offering your response from a Dutch perspective. Now we have five minutes for, for questions. <clears throat> is there any, is there any, um, question or comments you would like to submit? Just raise your hand, please.
perhaps if if yes. one of yes um I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if i could just ask the question but uh, perhaps if other of the panelists also would like to to reply or to ask some questions, uh, also please feel free to do that. But I, I think that I can ask a question now that I'm here. Um, one of, I mean, the, um, we heard yesterday from the from Benjamin Angel from the AU uh, Directorate uh, that there will be a lot of work now in the Pillar Two, and that the Pillar One is still a little complicated for the AU. And, but of course, that first we will start with the pillar two. And my question perhaps to Dan is how you are going to, in the Netherlands, to reconcile the fact that the pillar two will be a directive and that in the, in the OECD, the pillar two is, could be broader, could be less. And, and I understand that sometimes with the implementation of the ATAT, there was also a lot of uh, discussions. And especially there was also a consultation, if I'm not mistaken, on the implementation of the ATAT with business uh, sector. So how is going to work now with this pillar two once it's in a country like the EU? Um, well, I, I, I'm not sure I, I fully understand your question, but, but are you asking about um, um, a different time path for, for pillar one and pillar two potentially and, and consultations with business or? Yeah, so then the Netherlands in principle, then uh, the EU will be discussing the directive on pillar two and that is started mm -hmm. already and they will uh, have most likely a directive by next year. Mm -hmm. And it's going further, I will go faster than the pillar one. And once it has a directive, then the question will be how you are going to, in the Netherlands, going to reconcile what the pillar two is about in the directive and what the pillar two is about in the OECD assignment. Um, right, so, so, so and, and, and that's assuming that there may be a difference between, uh, between the two. Um, um, yeah, I, I think from the outset, as I said, we've we've supported uh, uh, pillar two. We're we're happy that that we've been able to uh, to agree that at the OECD level, um, and uh, yeah, we're also facing a very ambitious implementation uh, time frame. So so, um, I, I think what we've always said is is, is that um, we believe that an EU directive is a, a logical next step after agreement in the OECD um, to get to a uniform. Uh, implementation of, of, of both pillars uh, within the EU single single market. Um, so, so we're happy that the EU has announced that they will come with a uh, directive. Um, once it's there, there, there's an entire process in the, in, in the Netherlands about how we deal with directives, how we inform Parliament, um, uh, and how that the decision forming process uh, is going. I, I don't think the fact that that pillar one may be a little later. Um, will be an, an, an issue for us, although it's ultimately up to to to, to our politicians, to to our parliament, to uh, to to decide on that. But we're facing a, a very strict implementation deadline. I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, pillar two, in terms of of having concrete uh, uh, a, a concrete set of rules, is a little further than than pillar one. In the sense that pillar one has, still has a uh, a lot of uh, technical issues that we need to, to flush out. Um, and, and I certainly don't think that we should uh, delay the pillar two discussions to wait for, 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 for pillar one finalization in the, uh, in the OECD. Thank you very much. One, one small question to David, if I may. Uh, David, do you think that pillar one and pillar two um, may bring stability to the international tax regime or it would be necessary to, to embark in a potential pillar three in the near future? Oh, please don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I, think, um, I, I think it will bring uh, a greater degree of stability and um, all, all changes have to be worked through and implemented and there's no question about that. But uh, I think one of the, the starting points in the discussion has been, what is the counterfactual of no agreement? And you know, it is not correct to think of the counterfactual of no agreement as being a state of stability, because that's not what we've been experiencing. And in fact, in recent years, we've been experiencing increased fragmentation of the international system and increased uh, disputes. Now, the, the most um, 
visible example of increased disputes has been what we saw with the, the digital services taxes. Now, the digital services taxes emerged because some nation states believed that the international tax rules were not addressing this digital question, this lack of physical presence question. And in the absence of any international agreement, they took matters into their own hands. Now, I'm not here to, to, to say whether that was the right or the wrong thing to do. That's the reality of what has happened. And in response to that, we saw very swift and, and very strong trade retaliatory action uh, from the United States. And then we saw the threat of, of counter retaliation from, from the countries that were uh, involved in uh, introducing the, the digital services taxes in the first place. Now, um, now, it all started with just a small number of jurisdictions, but we saw over time more and more jurisdictions exploring the possibility of going down the digital services tax path. Now, if you'd gone down that path, you get double taxation, um, you know, taxing uh, turnover will inevitably have adverse impacts um, on those firms that are less profitable than others. Um, and there are a whole range of other potential distortions that might emerge from that. The one thing that you can guarantee is if there is international agreement that there will be mechanisms to try and relieve that, that double taxation. And that is a process that has been agreed at the high level and is now the subject of ongoing negotiation uh, in terms of the technical detail. So I think at that level, um, the, the alternative would have been a much more unstable system uh, than, what we, than, than what we will see moving forward. Now, as I said at the outset, that doesn't mean that any system is perfect or that any system stays static over time. You would expect ongoing evolution, uh, but I think that that's worth noting. Just the final point I would make is that the, the new provisions in relation to tax certainty uh, as part of Pillar 1 will, will play a very important role in bringing a greater degree of, of stability as well. Now, um, you know, these were very... Um, you know, important and sometimes contentious discussions around these issues, but um, that will be the case. So removal of the DSTs, um, moving towards um, consensus around uh, the new arrangements, uh, I think it is going to improve certainty rather than lead to greater uncertainty. Thank you very much, David. Now it is time to, to invite, I mean, representatives of three large market jurisdictions I will list them in alphabetical order, China, India, and the US. So uh, I'm first delighted to, to invite Professor Wei Xiong from law school of uh, Wuhan, Wuhan University in China to offer uh, your response to, to, this, to this question. Wei, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ecuador. Uh, um, it is uh, very late in China now, so yeah, we are uh, to my presentation uh, shortly and briefly. Um, for what is the most appropriate international tax region for the 21st century, uh, people may have different answers to the question. The G20 OECD's answer is a, a, the two pillar solution. Pillar one uh, permits the very allocation of taxing right to uh, the market jurisdictions, while pillar two adopts global minimum tax to address profit shifting by uh, multinational enterprises. Uh, 133 tax jurisdictions, including China, endorsed this uh, proposal. So as a global consensus, how will the two pillar solution affect China, where it achieves substantive fairness in international tax region and uh, are we on the right direction to achieve this goal? This uh, uh, the issues I would like to mention here briefly. So as uh, a member of the inclusive framework, China has endorsed the two pillars proposal at the G20 finance ministers and the central bank governors meeting. China's finance minister Liu Kun said, so China has always supported and worked to promote uh, a multilateral consensus solution to uh, eliminate unilateral measures and uh, reshape a fair, more stable, and more sustainable international tax system. 
Accordingly, China commits to play an active role in the framework of the G20 and OECD to participate in the technical work and the following consultations. So regarding pillar one, amount A requires two criteria to be met, a global turnover about 20 billion euros and profitability about 10%. Most of the target companies in China are in energy, banking, and insurance industries. While extractive and uh, regulated finance services are excluded, the number of affected companies would be reduced significantly. Uh, in addition, because of the large market, both traditional and the digital businesses, so China may be allocated a portion of the taxing right from pillar one. Regarding pillar two, China's corporate tax income tax rate is 25% now uh, in January. And the professional rate for high tax enterprises is 15%. So of course, with multiple tax benefits in some areas and uh, for some industries, the effective tax rate uh, would be less than 15%. However, if you take all the elements into consideration, generally speaking, China is not a low tax jurisdiction. Uh, the impact from global minimum tax would be uh, very limited. So when the attention is turned back to the global level, Will the two pillar solution achieve substantive fairness in international tax arena? Admittedly, it appears a very complicated scenario for substantive fairness in the context of international taxation, which is related to economic development and the technological progress, as well as international political gaming. It's not easy to find a solution that is accepted by all the participants. The two pillar proposal has achieved a global deal, which is clearly worth of congratulations. However, the global consensus is closely linked to political compromise. In the final solution on the table, pillar one focuses on tax and rights of uh, marked countries, while pillar two reverts back to resident states Within one reform solution, there are two distinct directions that could tear up the overall goal of taxing profits where economic activities take place, the venue is created. At the same time, behind the two pillar solution, the right to tax intangible assets and the residue profits is still mainly in the hands of resident countries. So to address the issue of substantive fairness in international taxation, it's bad to consider whether developing countries could benefit substantially from the two pillar solution. There's no doubt that the deal could generate additional tax revenues globally and the pillar one plans to allocate extra jurisdiction to market countries. However, it is those rich countries who always have large markets. So we may see large amount of the revenue still remain in the hands of uh, residents countries or those rich countries, not the poor countries. It appears that the market countries gain far less from pillar one than resident countries gain from pillar two. Uh, as for pillar two, it stems in part from a US uh, guilty or beat, which aims to accelerate the repatriation process. But it's difficult for developing countries to benefit more from guilty rules. Although it's widely believed that BEPs are blamed on tax competition, tax incentives are still very important tool for a uh, very important tool for developing countries to pursue economic and social development. 
So during the consultation um, period two proposal, uh, some jurisdictions, including Ireland, Hungary, expressed the reservations about uh, the proposal. And the final version for the global minimum tax is uh, determined from at least 15% to uh, 15%. Well, the two pillar solution is not perfect and is not a systematic reform of the international tax region. It does represent a step forward in tax right of market countries and has promoted a great deal global deal. So should we go further down this direction in the future? How to deal with conflicting interests among sovereign states? First of all, I think it's important to hear the voices of developing countries. Uh, just like um, Professor Peter Hongler said in his book, Justice in, uh, in International Tax Law, in order to achieve the goal of justice, the moral duty for humanitarian could be considered. Chinese government has recently advocated the diplomatic idea of a shared community dealing with the issue yeah, in dealing with the issue of allocation in international taxation, we may draw on this diplomatic idea to give developing countries a great voice. It is worth of being appraised that the OECD and have invited non-number countries, particularly developing and undeveloped countries, to establish an inclusive framework for the purpose of discussing the two pillar solutions. Although this does not mean that those countries really enjoy substantial opportunities for decision-making, it is still represents an extent of progress toward the right direction. Uh, similarly, the Belt and Road Initiative Tax Administration Cooperation Mechanism launched by China in 2019 also prompted to create a platform serving the bad and the road states. Most of them are developing and underdeveloping countries. Yes. One minute. Secondly, the international assistance to developing countries should not be limited to expand size. The revenue side also could serve uh, for the development of those uh, poor countries. So for this purpose is post it should be possible for give more benefits to developing countries by the international tax system. Last but not the least, in addition to the demand for more share of revenue, the developing and underdeveloping countries should also, also need to improve the tax administration ability. And this is the foundation for those countries to exercise their tax jurisdiction substantively. So in this respect, I think the uh, Bradcom are doing the right thing based on its ideology. Uh, by the means of personal training, seminar discussion, or other kind of international support, members could enjoy the resources and learn from each other to achieve the goal of capacity building. And it's also very important to enhance the capacity capacity of developing countries to use the information technology for tax administration. So um, although the pillar, two pillars- uh, Pero, uh, Professor Xiong, the, the time is okay. up. Do you have one more minute, please? Thank you. Um, uh, those, pillar, those proposals need to be implemented through treaties and domestication. Even this process has been completed smoothly. Uh, in order to achieve a substantive fair international tax system, uh, I think they still have a lot of things to do from the perspective uh, of developing countries. Uh, that's the things I, I would like to share with uh, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Xiong, for your response from a Chinese perspective. And now I am delighted to, to invite Rasmi Ranjan Das, uh, his competent authority, India, and member of the OECD Inclusive Framework. 
warm welcome and we're looking forward to hearing your response to this question, please. You are muted. Sorry for that. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo and uh, uh, organizers of this uh, conference, uh, Dr. Saima and Suranjali and others for inviting me. Um, as Dan said, uh, my views here are personal views and do not necessarily represent the views of the government of India. Now, coming to the question, um, I think my answer will be um, in the context of pillar one and pillar two, uh, particularly, I think that's what we're looking at. Yes. Is, uh, a broad yes. I mean, I, I certainly hope so that it becomes fit. When I say a tax regime for the 21st century, whether it is fit or not, I look at it uh, in a way that whether it is fair and equitable. And the fair and equitable in the terms of the jurisdictions in the international tax regime, which jurisdiction gets what? Because I believe that businesses should be agnostic about uh, where they are taxed. They should be concerned that the taxes should be reasonable and there should be no double taxation. So the international tax system primarily is about who gets to tax and how much to tax. And as, as David said, the existing rules which were framed almost a hundred years back, almost 1920s, uh, there are serious flaws so far as 21st century is concerned. If you have those rules, I think as someone has said that every everything from 1920s is in the museums except the international tax rules. Now, the two problems, David has spoken about one, about uh, the necessity of the, the jurisdiction to have taxing rights unless there is a physical presence, which is not required today in 21st century for digitalized business models. But the other one, which is equally important, is the way that even if you have a taxing right, how much a country gets to tax, which is governed by uh, the arm's length principle, the separate entity approach which I believe is completely divorced from the reality. I mean, MNEs do not operate as separate entities. They, are operate, they operate as integrated enterprises. And particularly in respect of these business models that rely on intangibles, which do not have any observable location. You can put intangibles anywhere in the world. ALP fails to deliver a fair result in most cases. Given this background, I think there was a discussion in the last panel uh, about the BEPS one. Uh, I can say the frustration of many of the panelists and the book particularly presented by Annette about the African uh, BEPS experience. BEPS one is, as David said, I agree with him. It's, it's revolutionary when it was done, but ultimately it was not meant to fundamentally change the tax system. It only tried to block certain loopholes and say ALP, uh, the Action 8 to 10 reports, uh, I think uh, if I can be charitable, I can say that it only added some pages to the OECD uh, transfer pricing manual. But beyond that, uh, nothing happened. But there are, of course, several good things in uh, BEPS 1, like uh, Action 4 or Action 13, which I think are very relevant for even developing countries. And the narrative about not having a situation where there is double non-taxation. But as you know, despite that BEPS one, the countries were not happy because the fine, the basic question of taxing rights were not addressed. And despite the BEPS one, the BEPS uh, in the country losing the corporate tax revenue continued. I mean, in the recently released report, uh, mostly done by uh, Mr. Bradbury of OECD, uh, based on the CBCR uh, preliminary analysis, it shows that still, even in 20, today, uh, more than 26% of the MNE profits are reported in low tax jurisdictions, which have only 3% of the employee uh, in those jurisdictions. I mean, still, the, the, there is misalignment between the jurisdictions where profits are reported and where economic activities are taking place. Um, there was uh, the colleague from UNDP are saying that 89 billion dollars uh, go out every year from African illicit financing. The tax justice framework, uh, tax justice network says that almost uh, a one trillion US dollars gets shifted to no tax jurisdictions. And even Fortune 500 companies effective tax rate is only 11%. And that way it's, I think 15% is a decent uh, number. Given this background, I feel that 
the pillar one and pillar two, if implemented properly uh, going forward, will bring a more fair and equitable um, tax system. Because first, as David also said this, this aligns the taxation principle with the reality. We first time look at m &E as a group for the first time at international level, which is the reality. Looking at m &E as in separate entities, I think that is not the real reality and that is what uh, allowed uh, such tax planning and tax avoidance uh, um, uh, structures. The second, of course, uh, is uh, giving part of the profit to market. As I was saying, aligning profits with economic activity doesn't only mean economic activity on the production side, which ALP always emphasized, but also the market, the customers. You know, no profit is made if a shop is closed, even if you have the best of the goods. So that is what needs to be recognized. That's why the system is a little bit more fair. Coming to pillar two, I'm happy that we are now giving, uh, moving, the narrative is moving. You know, we started with till 1900 or 20, at the beginning of this century, the all double taxation avoidance agreements were for avoiding double taxation. Then we had BEPS one, we said uh, we should not have uh, double non-taxation also, but that was not enough as I said. The pillar two ensures that there will be a certain minimum level of taxation. Now, more important than that, whether or not the developing countries, uh, as, as the colleague from Brazil was saying, whether they will benefit from IRR, they may not. Honestly, many developing countries will not benefit if they don't, don't have MNEs. But I think the benefit will come overall because of the, of the behavioral response that the pillar two will induce. The low tax jurisdictions will lose the incentive to keep it low because if they keep the tax low, somebody else will tax it. And m and is also for them, hopefully, the tax will cease to be a major incentive. In fact, I will see going three, four years down the line, if um, having uh, reducing the effective tax rate ceases to be a performance benchmark indicator for the CFOs and CEOs of the m and and that the, I think then we'll know that pillar two has succeeded. But uh, today, as we stand uh, designing the details of the pillar one, pillar two, I still feel it's a significant accomplishment for updating international architecture. David has already spoken about the counterfactual of not having a consensus. There is no stability. It's, it's, I mean, it's already an unstable order. Hopefully, it will be relatively stable, relatively fairer, and relatively equitable. And hopefully, it will be more fit for purpose than what it is today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Rasmi. And now I'm delighted to invite Professor Lillian Faulhaber from George, Georgetown University Law School. Um, Lillian, the floor is yours. Welcome. Great, thank, thank you so much. And thank you so much for, for inviting me to this conference. I'm thrilled to be part of this. I will share in my predecessor's um, comments I think the US government would be very confident that I am not speaking for them. So I am just speaking here as a US academic <clears throat> and not as a representative of the US. So I actually put slides together. So just sort of for a little, a little refresher and change from what we've been having, I will share my screen so that we have some slides behind me and I will try to wrap this up quickly so that we can, um, so that everybody after me has a time to, to speak. So hold on one second while I share my slide. Great, can you all see that? Perfect. Excellent, okay, thank you so much. So this is the question, and I thought I would take this, this opportunity to look at two ways that pillar one and pillar two could represent major changes in our international tax regime, and then to consider whether or not they actually do represent these major changes, or whether major more work still remains to be done. So um, I will just start by saying I agree with David's point. So I worked on BEPS 1, and I agree that if you had told me a few years ago that you would have 137 countries agreeing to essentially any part of Pillar 1 or Pillar 2, I might have been less nice and said that that was impossible rather than saying that you're ambitious. So the fact that we're having this conversation is itself a sign that there has already been a major dramatic change. The question I'm asking is more, has this actually changed our tax regime, right? Do we have a different regime now than we, we were working with before? So there are two possibilities that I see pillar one and pillar two 
opening up in terms of a major change in the tax regime. So the first possibility is that actually we're moving toward destination-based taxation, right? So for years, we've had economists arguing that if we have our corporate income taxes based on destination or market, this is more efficient and less distortive. So in the current economy, why would this be important? Well, it makes it harder for taxpayers to avoid taxation. If you're basing your corporate income tax on destination, it doesn't rely on physical presence. And so it more accurately reflects how tech companies and other companies of the 21st century make money. So you can see pillar one as being a first step in that direction. Now, Pillar one, when I say this, we all know it's only focusing on the return above a certain routine return, and only a portion of that residual return is being allocated to market jurisdictions. But what's important is that this is an allocation to market jurisdictions that didn't used to have a voice and that didn't used to be getting any allocation. So market jurisdictions as destination jurisdictions are now suddenly getting income allocated to them in a way that hasn't happened in our existing international tax regime. So is this a first step toward destination-based taxation? Once countries and taxpayers are, are sort of aware that this works, they get used to this, is this going to make them more comfortable with destination-based taxation as a whole? Is this going to be a test case? And if it works well, from the perspective of taxpayers and tax administrations, is this going to move us toward destination-based taxation? If so, that's a complete overhaul of our international tax system. Another possible outcome from pillar one and pillar two is that actually we could be moving toward harmonized tax rates. So again, pillar one can be seen as a first step toward destination, pillar two can be seen as a first step toward harmonization. Now, pillar two, is not saying everyone is adopting a 15% rate. Pillar two only applies to subsidiaries of co companies that are parented in countries who choose to implement a minimum tax. But pillar two does prohibit countries from having minimum taxes with higher or lower rates. That's part of the common approach is that you agree to 15%. And the discussion around pillar two, and I will have a US focus right here, particularly what the US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has said, marks a significant change in rhetoric around low tax rates. So it used to be that the US and other countries refused to say that a certain rate was low, that a below a certain rate was too low. But now countries have actually started saying that the race to the bottom is a problem and they've implied that 15% is an acceptable rate and below that is too low. This is a major change in terms of moving toward a harmonized rate. So the question here is, will countries with rates below 15% end up raising their rate to 15% because the subsidiaries located in those countries are subject to the minimum tax? And there's the other side, will countries with higher rates feel that they can lower their rates to 15% in response to that. So if that happens, then we could be moving toward harmonized tax rates. And again, why would that matter? Well, that would be an end of tax competition. And it would make it harder for taxpayers to avoid taxation. And it would make it easier for countries to raise revenue without feeling that they have to be involved in the race to the bottom. So either of these possibilities would be a huge overhaul of the international tax system. Now, a third possibility is that neither of these two will actually happen. And I agree again with David, we're not just going to stay in sort of a fixed status quo. We don't actually know if we don't have these changes where we're going to move. But this third possibility is that instead of having a wholesale overhaul, you'll have kind of minor changes at the margin. Um, and so I think figuring out which of these outcomes you're going to have depends on what really is going to happen with pillar one and pillar two. And so with pillar one, how many countries will actually sign on to the convention? That depends on the technical changes that are made in the next year and also the political changes. Again, I'm speaking from the United States, right? Is the United States going to be able to ratify this convention? And is the United States, if they're not able to ratify the convention, going to be able to convince other countries and the US itself that this is the type of agreement that doesn't need Senate ratification. 
Also, what will the rules look like? So the source rule, there are specific source rules that still need to be defined. And if this is a move toward destination, those rules are going to define what destination means. Also, currently, this is going to apply to about 100 countries. That's a very tiny first step if it's a step toward a major overhaul. Will the scope expand? It's scheduled to, to consider expansion. How, ex how much will it expand in the future? Um, also, right now, this is on top of our existing tax system. So even if countries and taxpayers accept Pillar 1 and Amount A, will this acceptance of a small amount allocated to market jurisdictions lead to acceptance of a larger change? For Pillar 2, this is an even bigger question because Pillar 2 doesn't have a convention. Pillar 2 is a common approach. So how many countries will adopt a minimum tax? Will any? Will all of them? That's an open question. And what kind of exceptions will there be? Will this really impose a pure 15% rate? Well, that depends on what's included in the effective tax rate. What can not be included in calculating your 15%? How do special tax regimes and other favorable rates fit in here? What about carve-outs like the substance-based carve-out and other exceptions, right? Those questions are in a matter in terms of whether or not taxpayers feel that they're being subject to a 15% tax rate. Um, so whether or not we're heading toward an international tax regime fit for the 21st century, well, I think the answer to that is it depends. It depends on whether countries all sign on to the Pillar 1 convention, how easy it is to expand that new allocation amount. It depends on which countries, if any, adopt minimum taxes, and it depends on the, on the technical details in both areas. And politically, it depends on how taxpayers and tax administrations respond to these developments. Do they see a benefit to this new allocation amount and nexus rule? Do they see a reduction in tax competition? If they do, then pillar one and pillar two together are going to be opening the door to very different tax systems from what we have right now. But if not, then these developments are still really significant. They're still changes, but they're not guaranteed to fundamentally change the tax system that we have. So I would argue that a lot of work, both political and technical, remains to be done before we can know whether or not we'll have a new international tax regime and what that will, will look like. So thank you again for including me. I will stop sharing and I look forward to hearing other comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian, for your uh, response. And now we have time for one or two questions before focusing on developing countries using Africa as a case study. I wonder if there is a question on... Uh, related to, I mean, the, these three large market jurisdictions, China, India, and the United States of America. Any questions? Um, may I submit one? Um, my questions are to, to Lillian. I mean, what sort of um, interaction can you see from uh, between the US and China in relation to pillar one and pillar two? Is it a, a cooperative game? Uh, are the interests of these two countries fully aligned or not? What, what do you think about that? So I think that's a great question. I think actually one of the really interesting questions about countries negotiating positions in this current discussion is how much they're thinking of themselves in the future. So right now, the United States is the residence jurisdiction of the majority of the, of the companies that will be targeted by pillar one amount A. But that's not necessarily going to be true in the future, right? China very much could be the residence jurisdiction of some of these companies in the future, and the US could not be, right? We're in different stages of sort of where we are in our economies and our development. And so in some ways, there may be a sense that China's interests in the future are similar to the US's interests now and vice versa. And if they are taking that position when they're negotiating, that may actually put them in more alignment than you would necessarily think that they have right now as you look at their at, at their at sort of the position of their countries. So um, I think my answer is, I think if you were to sort of telescope out to many years from now, you might actually think that they should have been taking opposite negotiating positions from what they necessarily took. And maybe that means that big picture, both of them have an interest in the other person, in the other country's position. Excellent, Lillian. Thank you so, so much for that illuminating response. Now we will, we will start the, the final part of, of the closing panel, 
which is to try to understand the, I mean, the developing countries uh, approach to pillar one and pillar two using Africa as a case study. So I'm, I'm delighted to, to invite Professor Annette Ogutu from the University of Pretoria to offer her views on how this question should be answered uh, using Africa as a case study. Annette, the floor is yours, 10 minutes. Thank you, Eduardo. I'll start with the obvious that the 21st century is characterized by the digital economy, which has transformed business models and has shaped the organization of the global economy. However, the digital economy has impacted on the ability of countries to effectively apply the existing century old international tax rules. And obviously this has enabled multinationals to engage in bets. And in 2015, the OECD, as we all have discussed, had came up with uh, the BEPS action measures. Although those action measures are commendable in addressing the BEPS measures that we are dealing with, overall, the approach was to trick those century old rules to make them stronger in addressing BEPS, which poses doubts as to whether these rules, which will literally remain as the the first layer on top of pillar one and pillar two is whether these rules will actually remain effective in a continuously evolving digital economy. That's a question to contain with. Now, one of the century old cornerstones of the international tax system, which uh, are the, the BEPS measures uh, try to reinforce is the arm's length principle that is relied on to prevent transfer pricing practices. This principle was developed in a context where the basic structure of multinationals was less integrated. By the 20th century, intergroup trade among uh, 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 multinationals had become increasingly uh, um, integrated, uh, which made it very difficult to apply the comparability analysis that is needed uh, to determine arms length prices. Over the last few decades, commentators have called for the abandonment of the arms length principle and a move towards unitary taxation, whereby a formula is used to divide uh, 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 the consolidated uh, corporate, uh, uh, the, to divide the income of uh, multinationals and a uh, deal with the consolidated corporate group profits of a multinational. The 8th October agreement uh, has taken this aboard, and we see that now that the starting point of allocating income would be group profits by using the consolidated financial statements of companies. Now the agreed profits uh, allocation mechanism is the deemed routine profits, which would be first be allocated to countries where activities are performed. And then the remaining residual profits will be shared among market jurisdictions. And we have heard a lot about that. The arm's length principle will continue to apply for routine market uh, uh, marketing and distribution functions that take place in market jurisdictions. Now, the notion of reduce residual profits, although it's commended, as we heard from other speakers, for extending taxation to market jurisdictions, it is, however, out of touch with 21st century businesses, as it is based on an assumption that the residual profits of multinationals are mainly attributable to their home countries, while activities elsewhere around the world only result in profits. This view overlooks that multinationals de derive their super profits from the synergies due to their global coordination of activities located in, most, uh, uh, in their most suitable locations and to the economies of size and scale allowing them to dominate markets around the world. The other century old cornerstone of the international tax system is the permanent establishment concept, which requires a physical presence for source countries to tax our business profits. Whereas in the 21st century uh, uh, digital business models, there is no need for having a physical presence. The agreement on the new rules to tax the digital economy sets out a new tax nexus, which does not depend on physical presence, but largely on sales in market jurisdictions. However, this new nexus, as we've all said, will only apply to a few multinationals, possibly only a hundred, most of which are headquartered in the US, China, German, France, and Japan. The question is, if will this be sustainable in the 21st century as the initial plan was to develop a new nexus for the whole digital economy? 
There are also concerns that in-scope multinationals may find a way of circumventing the 10% profitability to fall out of the scope. The risk of base erosion means that there may be an, it, 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 the whole system may create a disincentive for countries to stop applying unilateral measures. To address concerns of developing countries that the limited scope would not apply to smaller multinationals that operate within the, their jurisdictions, a new special nexus was agreed, which, which permits amount A to market, uh, uh, which permits allocating amount A to a market jurisdiction when in scope multinationals uh, derive at least 1 million euros uh, in revenue from that jurisdiction. And for smaller jurisdictions, many of which are in Africa, where the GDP is lower than 40 billion euros, the nexus will be at 250,000 uh, uh, 250, euros. Now, although this special uh, nexus is a welcome development, the administrability of a two-tier system is going to be an issue. The question then arises is, why this special nexus should not apply to others to others out of scope multinationals operating in developing countries that also derive similar amounts. A principled and uniform approach is required to ensure tax certainty in the 21st century. The allocation of taxing rights under, a new rule, under the new rules continues to perpetuate the century old unfair taxing rights for source countries. In terms of the agreement for, uh, um, for in-scope multinationals, the quantum of 25% of residual profits will be allocated to money market jurisdictions to share. Obviously, there's been a lot of concern about it, with ATAF suggesting that at least they should have been 35% of residual profits to share. The, uh, uh, essentially, what we have is that historical profit allocation rules have that have been tilted in favor of residence countries are continuing to be perpetuated. The OECD BEPS project uh, categorically refused to deal with matters pertaining to the allocation of taxing rights between source and resident states. The agreement on pillar one is also unsatisfactory in addressing this matter, which has predominantly been the dividing factor between capital exporting and capital importing country. So the fact that this matter has not been uh, addressed effectively uh, is one of the issues that is of concern to developing countries as to whether the system will be that effective in the 21st century. Two minutes. So in yeah. order, two minutes, all right. Uh, the other issue I need to raise is that uh, the implementation of the new rules to tax the digital economy will be enabled by a multilateral instrument as we had, but the uptake of the BEPS uh, uh, Action filler one, multilateral instrument, if that is anything to go by, shows that few developing countries have actually ratified it. So relying on multilateral instruments for the international system to function could be a problem. Layering one instrument after another in the digital economy may create a complex system that may not actually be easily administrable. At present, the international tax norm setting is influenced by political power play by rich countries and subtle coercion to sign agreements, which, uh, if countries don't sign, could be visited by trade sanction. The silent, the silent power play among international bodies is actually uh, 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 quite an issue right now that needs to be addressed. Uh, we have uh, the likes of the OECD, the UN, and even the IMF creating soft law uh, and putting it uh, 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 for us to attend to. But now the issue about it is that this creates uncertainties for countries and even for businesses, worsened by the fact that there is actually no international tax code that uh, countries can go to to address any concerns that may raise. Uh, apart from domestic codes, uh, the only international tax dispute resolution mechanism is MAP, which is only available to aggrieved taxpayers uh, and not for states. We have uh, various issues that have risen up to raise concern in this matter. In 2017, the EU uh, prepared, uh, started preparing a list of non-cooperative non jurisdictions for tax purposes, which are subjected to certain sanctions uh, like reduced access to funding from the EU. And there were a number of African countries that were backlisted, which uh, becomes untenable, especially when the minimum standards that are set by the inclusive framework 
were supposed to be voluntarily. Uh, countries uh, with now pillar one and pillar two, we have Nigeria and Kenya that have signed have not signed up to the 8 October agreement. This risks this type of countries to be uh, visited with sanctions from these countries. And ATAF has called on developed countries not to exert political pressure on these countries or countries that are not members of the inclusive framework to be forced to join the agreement if they feel that uh, the system is not working in their favor. Another example of power play among uh, 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 the norm setting institutions such as the OECD and the UN, which may be untenable for the 21st century, is the fact that while the pillar one, pillar two, uh, discussions were are going on. There was a parallel discussion going on at the UN whereby they voted to include Article 12B into the Model Tax Convention that deals with automated digital services. And I'm going to wrap up quickly, please. Uh, basically, this gives uh, grant source countries greater taxing rights. For this country, for this article to be uh, 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 implementable, countries would be would have to enact domestic legislation so that this is applicable in terms of a treaty context. Um, uh, but however, the OECD uh, 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 8 October uh, uh, agreement requires that countries should not enact digital services tax or other similar taxes. In my mind, that instructions is tantamount to the OECD blocking the feasibility of the UN Article 12B. To address these uh, governance issues, the international community needs to confront the governance problem. As David uh, has uh, uh, rightfully stated, just like we confronted and embraced the previous contentious matters like country by country reporting, uh, allocation of income to multinationals using consolidated financial statements. And now we have the minimum, the global minimum tax. We need to confront the vexing issue of whether it is time for the international community to set up a 21st century global international tax body. I'm not saying that um, uh, uh, um, this is going to be an easy route, but we have had to work through very difficult issues, like I have said, but we need to come up with a solution in this regard in order to ensure a more inclusive level playing field in international tax, uh, uh, tax norm setting. And such a body would be instr instrumental in restoring order, legitimacy and proper governance of the international tax system. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Annette Owutu. And now, last but not least, I'm delighted to invite Anthony Munanda, uh, who will be offering us a, a unique perspective in the sense that he is working for the African Tax Administration Forums. So he will, he will be able to answer uh, this difficult question as a tax administrator with a very good understanding of, of this problem in, in Africa. Uh, Anthony, the floor is yours. 10 minutes, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, and good evening, good afternoon, and good morning if there's anyone who is uh, at that time zone. I trust that I'm audible. I have challenges with internet connectivity. Please let me know whether you can hear me. Uh, I'll be extremely brief uh, based on uh, having regard to the various uh, useful comments and addressing this question. Uh, and I think I'll just focus on a couple of issues. We've been asked to ask to reflect whether uh, we are heading uh, towards an international tax regime that is fit for 21st century. As a starting point is to uh, reflect what does uh, 21st century uh, uh, depict. And we've got two things there happening. One of it, of course, is digitalization. And second of that, obviously, is a couple of challenges which the world is facing. Uh, those have been, been exacerbated by COVID-19. And uh, the way we see us, uh, a tax system which helps us to move ahead to solve the problems of digitalization and also address challenges of, of course, increasing poverty and, of course, challenges of, of course, uh, poor economic uh, an effective and equitable tax system. 
Uh, so there are many things we could talk through in pillar one and pillar two, uh, but the, the main message, at least the way we see it as in ATAF, is to see do we achieve an effective system which eventually is equitable. So if you go back to pillar one, I think we all agree there's progression, there's step in the right direction in, of course, coming up with a new system which helps us to depart from arm's length principle uh, to address the challenges that that arm's length principle has been having in uh, fair allocation of taxing rights. So using a formulaic approach, that's a good step going forward. And obviously um, being able to use uh, uh, a different approach to identify taxable presents uh, based obviously on the quantum of sales through the special nexus rule. Those are good things, steps in the right direction. But at least uh, from our side in HETAF, we still see that uh, uh, the quantum of amount A still remains uh, not sufficient. Uh, we uh, propose that uh, we have a different way of allocating that profit. Uh, but obviously, we did not get uh, HETAF proposal. Uh, HETAF proposal was having even a much lower threshold, meaning many MNEs would be in scope was proposing an escalator in allocation of uh, uh, profits to the market jurisdiction. Um, and ultimately, you would have more MEs, of course, getting more profits allocated. However, under our comprehensive uh, approach, uh, that did not go through. Uh, but we propose, an, in the alternative, at least 25, I mean, 20, 35% uh, of the profits should have been allocated. We all know we add 25% as the residue profit of in-scope MNEs to be allocated. Uh, still is going to result some profit, but there are challenges of small economies, small markets, very minimal taxes will be allocated. Two minutes, the last thing I Anthony, two minutes. About, uh, yeah, it's two minutes are enough. On pillar two, um, I think pillar two has uh, bigger challenges for us. Uh, particularly the globe rule, uh, because of one, where the minimum rate was, was set, and secondly, obviously, the priority of the rules. Okay, And we see several challenges there. One, of course, it, the globe rules will not be uh, effective in protecting African tax base because there is still incentive to base a road. Why? Because the average tax rates are around 20 uh, 25% all the way to going to 28%. So that still is a problem. Uh, and of course, um, uh, on, on the subject to tax rule on pillar two, and uh, the main issue is obviously the scope of the rule. Uh, we acknowledge of course it is going to be a minimum standard at least to some uh, countries, uh, but still there are issues to be addressed. Overall, there are steps in the right direction. Uh, but there are still challenges to achieve equitable system, uh, which of course benefits uh, uh, smaller markets and of course benefits uh, countries which have been experiencing huge imbalance in allocation of tax and rights. So in the interest of time, I'll stop there. There are of course many more specifics of that I wanted to address. Thank you for Don't, the time. And thank, thank you. you for inviting me to participate in this uh, symposium. Thank you so much, Anthony Munanda. And uh, in the name of, uh, uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to, to thank you all, the participants of the closing panel, for such illuminating responses to this difficult question. Now I invite Professor Mosquera to, to close our third Global Tax Symposium. Over to you, Irma. Thank you so much, Eduardo, and thank you everyone for being here and especially to the final panel. And we know that we are a little late, we apologize for that, but we do think that it was good to, to build it in such a way that it's, there is a lot of variety. Uh, the videos will be available and so you can also listen back to the presentations, the discussions. Thank you everyone, uh, thank you for being here, thank you to the to all the participants and especially all the ones who stay until the end. So we started yesterday morning with uh, New Zealand, Australia, and now we are finishing. And I think that in Canada is not kind of time to yes. have lunch or whatever. Yes, <laughs> so shall we take a picture of everyone? Could you please turn your camera on? Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. 
I don't know, if, Juliana, could you please take the official picture? Yes, please, Juliana. Juliana, can you do that? Excellent. Fantastic. As Stephen has just appeared, one more, one last uh, attempt, if possible. One, two, excellent. Fantastic. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, everyone. And you wonderful panel. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Have bye. a nice evening. Afternoon.